here, Barbara. <clears throat> how, how, how do we get the chat section on, on here again? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Click it. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Yeah, thanks. You want to hold on your screen a little bit and then I feel like your chin is off. Yeah. Do you have your sound on? I think so. And we're getting ready for it here. So, Brent, nice to see you. Tom Snook, nice to see you. Mark Goldfarb, I hope I, I hope my uh, I pulled that off. That the the uh, the pa I pulled that password off. I hope we don't get Zoom bombed tonight. That would be nice. Hey, welcome. Hopefully, nobody saw it. It shouldn't see it. It was up there for only an instant. Because um, my daughter found it like right away, so. Yeah, I don't see my face up there. Yeah, it's right up there. Hey, John, can you hear me? I can hear you. It's Guido from Jersey. Yes, yes. How are you doing? I'm trying to get my face up here. I'll, I'll be right with you. Oh, I, I see it. Yep, all right. Yep. And because yeah, I didn't see your oh, face, oh. I didn't see it, so. Yeah, I'm trying to get my face up there. That's Hi, right. John. Hi. Hi. Hi, John. Here. Jeff, nice. Nice to see you from Grafton. Hey, John. John, 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 I'm not an Fred expert. Oh, my gosh. Fred oh, my gosh. <laughs> I know Fred Levy. I'm his wife helping him with technical. Yes. Okay. Have a well, good meeting, guys. Thank you very much for helping me with technical last our last session. Yeah. yeah. How crazy was You're that, welcome. John? You're welcome. You're hey, welcome. Have a great meeting, you know, guys. It's you know, I figure getting zoom bombed is like getting your car keyed. You know, it's not because yeah. of who yeah. am, it's just people key cars and and those. I don't like to say a lot of things. Russian robots uh, zoom bomb. You know, so. Good thing my sister-in-law was here because uh, she was sit standing right. I said, "Come here, I want you to see what John looks like, the guy I'm always calling." Right. And she goes, "Get out! You're getting hacked! You're getting hacked!" Shut it down. Call him up. Tell him to shut it down. I said, yeah, oh well, anyway, God. thank you. Thank I didn't you, even man. know what the heck was going on myself. No, I didn't either, but it, it was yeah. evident very, very quickly. So, well, let me start because it's 7 o'clock. So, um, Can I interrupt you for a minute, John? Absolutely. It's uh, Peter Watt, um, just uh, some idiot from Canada. But if you um, go on your video, you can mirror... Uh, your image, and that way the your background will show up. Um, I believe will show up, um, so we can read it. I didn't realize. I I just I just see that it's um. Oh, backwards. Yeah. Okay. How about now? No. Is that any better? No. Same really? thing. Because I just I just hit I just hit that I just hit mirror. It says mirror background, and it looks right to me when i look at it on my screen okay we might have to refresh then so it's uh, it's okay john uh we're here for you anyway and we can see you well <laughs> yeah but it says gm on it i mean if it's backwards it says gm and i'm not prepared to talk about chevelle's you know so. <laughs> well john if you take the fuse out of the number one position put it in between two and three and flip it around hey, then the was, screen will face correctly and that was just the last tech call i took from a guy in in uh, california who called me and said, I, I, I hope I hope I'm not inter, you know interfering with your setup for your Zoom call, but you know, I'm working on this guy's wiring and suddenly I can't get the turn signals to work. 73B. And I said, it's a hazard light switch. He goes, What? But it's not the hazards, it's the turn signals. I said, Hey, it's always the hazard light switch. So yeah, whether it's the fuse or the hazard light switch. So and you guys know that it, at any time, almost at any time throughout any day that you want to call me. I'm going to mute everybody because we got some ba background noise here, but I'll invite you to um, unmute yourself when when uh, when you come up. You know that you can call me almost at any time throughout the day. I know it says one to two, but you can call me. If you get in a jam, because like if you get in a jam, like you don't want to wait till the next day or you don't want to wait until later in the afternoon. So I guess some I guess some some interesting stuff here um, that's just come up in the in the past couple of weeks. 
since our last Zoom meeting. Um, uh, one was the hazard light switch. Remember that's that's um, that's on all of them, 68 through 80. You know, when the tr turn signals stop working, both sides, and there's no power at the flasher, it's almost always the hazard light switch. You can buy a new one, but you can also take the old one apart very carefully and clean up the terminals and snap it back together and it'll work great. So I, I had to rebuild my uh, the, the charcoal canister for my daughter's uh, BGT this past week, and I needed some sort of foam, some sort of foam discs and uh, I sent her to Nap. She had to go to Napa anyway, and she took one along. And of course, their line always is what year and model. They didn't list it. So I used used to tell people uh, until this afternoon to um, to go to the hardware store and buy open cell foam. And that works until it gets gasoline on it, and then that disintegrates, and the and the charcoal can can uh, um, come out the bottom of it. So I was talking to a guy today. Well, I used a, a, a the final filter for my late wife's Neely vacuum cleaner. It's, it's a real tight knit kind of mesh stuff, um, some kind of fiber, it looked like it would work great, I used that. Anyway, the sky today says, well, I read that you could use Scotch-Brite, not the kind with the, with the, uh, uh, scratchy, the scratchy stuff on one side, but just it's Scotch-Brite that you can see through. It's like, yeah, dude, use that. I'm sure that'll, that'll stand up to gasoline when, if, or if, when, um, gasoline gets into the charcoal canister. So Scotch-Brite works inside there. Then I had another call this past weekend, uh, a guy from Chicago, this is a, this is a barn find story, this is so cool. Um, this guy's chasing an MGA, and so he, he answers an ad, I don't know where he saw it. And he goes in the, in the, in the storage barn, and there is, an MGA with a 1984 license plate on it. Um, and it's a 1500, 1600, pretty tough shape. Um, anyway, he calls me and he says, well, there's another M MG here with, with rear disc brakes on it. I said, there's no MG with disc brakes on it. Then I stopped for a minute. I said, well, can you FaceTime me? He said, sure. So he FaceTimes me and I look at it. And what I'm looking at, um, lying on its side is um, a MGA twin cam chassis with wheels, brakes, no engine, no, no gearbox, the thing's all stripped down, no body or anything, but there's that chassis. So I said, oh my gosh, <laughs> oh my gosh, somebody wants this, get it. If you don't use it your, yourself, you can, you, know, you can make those parts available. So anyway, so there still are truly barn finds. Tools. I asked people to bring tools to today, and I, it's hard for me to show this stuff, but here's this little tool here, okay? So I'm trying to get it in front of my face so it doesn't pixelate too much, but it's, it's this little uh, disc here that's got little teeth on it. See those teeth? So you take your TC starter, and you take the, you take the arm off the TC starter, you use the little screws on this and screw it into the starter motor. And then you turn this guy and it cleans the contacts on your TC starter motor. And that's a pretty cool tool. Krypton, it, it used to belong to, it says Norm on it. If you can see that, it says Norm, um, Norman uh, from, uh, British sports cars in, in the Stockton, California. So here's another tool. I, so here's, here's a, like a line wrench, okay? And I bent it and I hooked it up to a screwdriver. So those of you with an MGA know that tightening up the nut on the backside of the master cylinder is all but impossible unless you have this tool. And then it's a line wrench. You can put it right around the, the, the nut and, and turn it a sixth of a turn at a time. So there's tools that you can buy and there's tools that you can, uh, you can make. So um, the uh, sign up on my website, I thought was faulty. Um, if you wanna get on my, my email list and if we get Zoom bombed, I'm not sure I'm gonna advertise this out on Facebook anymore, but I've got a, I've got a um, constant contact list, and I've got about 
uh, about 5,000 names on it. So you can be on that list too. If you go on my website and it says sign up for my newsletter, that, that goes right on onto there. So let's see what else is news here. I got a note from uh, one of the um, long, long, long time, probably charter member, charter um, member of the uh, Michigan Rowdies that another one of the Rowdy members had passed away, Brian Beery. So that's something we hear too often now that some of the people that we've been de dealing with, you know, for a long time, long time have uh, made the great leap forward. Um, um, I got a note uh, from Rich Caldwell in, in Houston that he installed a USB port in his MGA if I knew how to take his short video that he sent to me on Facebook and post it here so you could see it, I would, but the point is it's a little tiny USB port. He put it back behind the passenger seat, hooked it to the, hooked it to the uh, battery, and it's not, you know, it's not for Bluetooth, it's just for charging, but it works. So, and it works regardless of whether you got positive or negative earth because you hook it up whichever way, you know, your, your battery is aligned. So that, that certainly, um, that's certainly a possibility. So um, last time we were talking about winter storage and we got Zoom bombed. Then I started off again and, and we had another two hours and it worked out just great. But a couple of people wrote me and said, oh, can't you go over winter storage again? And I don't wanna go over the whole thing again, but let me direct you to my website. And on there, on the top ribbon on my website, uh, way over on the right, just above the PayPal button that you can press and donate to me. Um, it says winter storage, and there it's got all the rules in there about winter storage. But here we are, those of us who are anywhere north of, I don't know, north of Texas um, and east of California have to worry about the winter. So here it comes. And you want to make sure you get your oil changed, and you want to make sure that the mice don't don't get in your car. But I did get a note from Crystal Johnson from from Texas, who said, "Can you talk about the various um, qualities of clutch components that are available for the MGB?" And I can't because I really don't know. My experience is you always buy the best you possibly can, the most expensive that you possibly can, but that's no assurance that you're gonna get a good product. Now let's just go quickly go over the whole clutch in an MGB and just talk about it real fast. And then if you have some more questions, those, those, those will come up later on. The clutch in an MGB, MGA, not a T-type, that's mechanical, but in a, a midget, um, you've got you got the clutch hydraulics, and you've got the the clutch it, itself. So um, the um, the slave cylinder, if it leaks, it's bad. If it bad, if it's bad, it leaks. So if it's not leaking, the slave cylinder isn't bad. The master cylinder goes bad a lot, um, which means that you press on the pedal and you can't get enough movement out of the out of the slave cylinder or nothing happens at all. You can buy a new clutch master cylinder. The new ones are, are um, they don't look like the right pieces. They're very inexpensive. I've had people call me and say, I can't get it to work. Um, someone else uh, weighed in and said that the clutch master cylinder for an MGB is the same as a Rover P4. I didn't write that down. That's just the push rod that changes. I sent my master cylinder off to White Post Restoration. It came back as two, $245 to get it resleeved and rebuilt. It's pretty expensive, but I know it's gonna work. It's gonna work forever because it's, it's brass sleek. Another thing that goes bad in, in the clutch hydraulics is the clutch hose. Now, usually it doesn't go so bad that you can't depress the clutch pedal, but when you let the clutch pedal back up, you hear a as the as the fluid is rushing through the hose, and the car feels kind of like an automatic. It doesn't leap forward. It's it slowly move. It slowly reengages. There's also a, a, a steel pipe. Those hardly ever go bad, except on a midget where they lie right underneath the battery and can rust through. 
So that leaves the, the actual clutch, which lies between the engine and gearbox, and the only realistic way to get it out of there is pull the engine. On an MGB, a non-overdrive MGB, you can, we used to at the shop, pull the gearbox without pulling the engine. After you've done it three or four times, you got it. But the first time around, is ju it's just a beast. Plus, you have both your hands extended in the air, holding on to the gearbox. At this age, most of us wouldn't choose to do that. It's difficult enough to pull out the engine, lifting it up against gravity, but holding the gearbox up in the air against gravity is something else. So first time around, doesn't make sense to pull just the, just the, the gearbox. So I had a guy call me and, and he had this bizarre problem with his clutch, it wouldn't disengage. Turns out whoever rebuilt the engine or put the clutch in, didn't put a spigot bush in the back of the crankshaft. So the first motion shaft was wallowing all, all around. It wouldn't disengage and it ruined the, ruined the front bearings on his gearbox. There's the clutch disc. Those hardly, I, I don't know of any bad ones. You can install it backwards and then it won't disengage, but there's hardly any, my experience is there's hardly any bad ones. Uh, TR6 disc is the same, a little bit bigger. Um, the pressure plate, clutch cover, um, the problem with those right now, with some I've heard, is that the thrust plate falls off it. That's the part that the release bearing goes up against. And of course, the problem that we talked about one or two times ago that I still haven't got a resolution on um, is that the throw up bearing goes bad. Oh my gosh, you know, and then uh, whether it lasts two minutes or two miles or 200 miles, it's premature to have to take it back out for failure. And I don't know if there's a solution to that yet, but um, Crystal, I will continue to investigate this and see how much more I come up with. There's also a fork, a bolt, and a bushing. that should always change the bolt and bushing when you change the clutch, 11G3195 and 11G3196. And the new bolts are often a little undersized, so the fork wobbles, shouldn't wobble at all when you put it together. Um, but sometimes the, the new fork wobbles. And there's a push rod, and making the push rod longer won't make the clutch work any better. Some, cl some clutches, some cars, TR6s, have got adjustable push rods. Ours don't, you don't need them. If, if the piston is popped out, sometimes that, that happens, the piston pops out of the slave cylinder, it's popped out for one of two reasons. Either the clutch itself is just toast on the inside, release bearings failed, and it overthrows dramatically, or the hose is plugged up and it's not able to relieve the pressure and you've pumped it a couple of times and just pushed the, the piston out. So anyway, that's a quick, quick talk about clutches and all the rest of the stuff that I, I wanted to cover. And I'll, I'll go over to chat now. Um, and, yes, Crystal. Uh, any opinion on, when I was looking at the clutches, right? Yeah. And I saw that the uh, release bearing comes in one of two types, a carbon face or bearings. Is there any preference whether to go with the carbon versus a bearing? Well, I, I don't like the bearing style because, I mean, it works on a TR6, but that's got a different setup. So physically, technically, I don't like it, but right now, it's better than the, the carbon ones that blow up. So right yeah. now, until we know that the, that the carbon face ones are good again, so we're sure of that, I'd go, with, I'd go with the roller bearing. Yeah, that's what I was reading. A lot of people were finding out that they replaced them and then 500 miles down oh, the road, they're gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I, uh, I was talking to a shop right outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. And the guy, the guy, you know, put a clutch in, test drive the car for I don't know, 20 miles, gave it to the customer. Customer got about five miles before it failed. And of course, the customer isn't looking at your supplier. Customer's looking at you. <laughs> so it's embarrassing. Yep. So anyway, so that's, that's uh, yeah, I, 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 I go with a roller bearing crystal. One last question on that. 
I noticed online that a company called MGB Hive yes. is selling the clutch kit made by Borg and Berg. Back. Have you heard Borg anything? And, well, that you that was the clutch of choice, Borg and Beck. But like a lot of companies, like Lucas, for instance, Lucas no longer exists, but the name exists, and you can you can you can pay a fee and then use the name. So I don't know what the quality is of the Borg and Beck. I don't know where they come from. Okay. I don't know. So. All right. Yeah, I was just having a problem trying to figure out whether to go with the AP, right, or the Borg and Beck, right? And when I'm going through the catalogs, you got the, the Gold Classics, you got the AP Premium, you got the Borg and Beck. I'm going, God, I don't know which one. The most okay. ex the the most expensive one, hoping hoping that that means the best one. <laughs> okay, thank you. You're welcome, welcome. Okay, so I've got my first up on chat today. We got 177 people on tonight. Holy moly! Right now, um, from Michael, to everybody, I've got an, a 1961 1622 engine in my 57 MGA. It was fully rebuilt. So, oh, Michael, Michael, if, if this is you, you can unmute yourself. I'm happy to talk to you. Um, uh, it was fully rebuilt 7,000 miles ago, but it recently needed a complete valve job and rocker arm rebuild. Needless to say, I wasn't happy. Okay, so why did it need that? Because it wasn't done right in the first place because um, they use the, uh, you use the phosphor bronze, the gold the valve guides, don't use those, use the cast iron ones. Um, because there wasn't a hole drilled in the rear cam bearing and the oil was getting up and oiling the rocker assembly, which would wipe out the cam also. Don't know, but that wasn't, that's not Michael's question. Michael's question is, um, uh, is about the idle. Before and after the recent valve job, initially, the engine idles around 1100, but then drops about 700 after 60 seconds at idle. If the engine is is warm, is warmed up, it'll idle around 900 and then drop to 500. Okay, he further says, I had my carbs rebuilt during the full rebuild, verified the movement of the carb pistons, and I've tried tuning them numerous times using the flow meter and check the timing. I've also sprayed brake cleaner in the butterfly bushings with no drop in RPM, so no leak there. Any suggestions on how to stabilize the idle? It's either um, it's either a mixture problem or it's a mechanical problem. And it's hard sometimes to, to tell which is which. The mixture problem, if, if it exists, is because you've got it, uh, the, the mixture adjusted incorrectly. When you take a, a tiny little screwdriver, just a tiny little screwdriver and push it down the throat of the, of the carburetor and turn the screwdriver, this is my mechanical pencil, not a screwdriver, turn that screwdriver ever so slightly and just barely disturb the position of the air piston. The RPM ought to climb about 50 to 75 and then fall off again. If the RPM falls instantly, it's too lean. If on the other hand, when you lift the air piston, just disturb its position, the RPM goes up, 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 up. The higher you lift the piston, it's too rich. So there's that. Um, disconnect the, the carburetors from each other, snap them, make sure that, that, that when you um, allow them to come back really, really slowly, um, that, that you can't press on one of the throttle stops and make it move you know, a half, half a degree farther, um, which means it's gonna close up. So anyway, that's, it, it's not timing, it's not valve lash, it's not tire pressure. Um, it has something to do with either mechanically the, um, the throttle or, or the throttle cable. You can have the throttle cable adjusted too tight. Um, it has to do, it's mechanical or it's the mixture. Which one, I, it's so hard to say. I've tried the mixture. I've done that, you know, a few times. Okay. It's interesting that the the front carburetor, you know, I use the little uh, plunger, uh, you know, underneath the carburetor, mm -hmm. the SU version of the screwdriver, and the front carburetor does exactly what you described. It speeds up then slows down. The rear carburetor doesn't do anything when you lift the uh, piston. 
but if you clean it out, uh, it, you know, you lift the piston and it will uh, just slow down. Uh, and if you uh, make it too rich, it'll speed up. So I get that. I don't get the speed up, slow down like on the front carburetor. I hadn't thought about the, uh, you know, I thought about the just the, the butterfly linkage. I tried that. I didn't think about the, uh, uh, the, the throttle cable. Uh, that could do it, I guess, too, and holding it up. So I'll, when I get when I get to the car again, I will go try that, and I'll try the linkage again, you know, just to make sure I didn't miss something, and then try and readjust sure. the uh, the thing. But those are those are pretty much the only three things that it could be, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I um, I mean, obviously, it's going to idle differently the more the temperature of the car changes. Right. temperature of the engine changes but but just sitting there I, idling it it, it should it, if it changes it's almost it's almost so as the mixture and you should be able to get a response out of the rear carburetor like you do the front those tickler those pins those piston lifting pins are handy if you've got the air cleaners on and on an mga it only right. takes half a day to get those things off right so you end up having to use them um but um i i I much prefer putting something down the throat. And just because the carburetors have been rebuilt, you know, even, I mean, just take the float ball off and, and make sure that the, that the, the, both the, um, you know, shake the, shake the, uh, the floats. Um, take, take a look at the levers underneath the float ball lids and just make sure that they're the same. I, there's, they're supposed to be the same. But um, I just had I'm you know I'm I'm really big on on those two guys that rebuild distributors, and one of my one of the people I talk to frequently ordered a distributor from one of the distributor guys and got it couldn't get it to work it absolutely would not work because the low tension lead was hooked up to ground. It's like how does that happen? Uh, it's either it's being sloppy, just being too too fast. Um, but everybody makes mistakes, so so you know just. Look at the carburetors. Look at the floats and stuff. Just, you know, when you're when you're desperate and you're going to the next next thing. Okay. Yeah. Just the you know the drop of 400 RPM. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. It just it, and it's annoying, right? And it just happens slowly uh, as I'm. Uh, you know, you're sitting there at a stoplight. Yeah, and, that's you know, almost always mixture. Okay. Well, I'll go back and redo it then. I'll okay. find out why that rear carburetor doesn't doesn't yeah. act like the front one. Thank you. Okay. All right, thanks. John, may I interrupt? Yes, Jeff. I thought, and maybe I missed a, a session, I thought you were gonna start with um, recreational gasoline today. Because you asked me to and I forgot, I'm sorry. So let's talk about recreational gasoline. Um, I was just someplace the other day and somebody, somebody had purchased gasoline from a um, marina and they claimed that that was different gasoline that you could get from the pump and I'm not sure why seems to me it would still have alcohol in it um, this is such an issue it used to be you put stable in the gasoline which is alcohol gasoline already has alcohol in it and then Mike from my old shop, he works for Forrest now. Um, oh my gosh, what is the stuff he used? I can never remember the name of it. Star or something or other, star or something, star. Um, he loved that. What's your- Seafoam? What's, what's that? Seafoam? No, something with the word star. John, it. it's yeah. star Startron. Startron, Startron. Thanks, Tony. Yep. Um, so in, in, anyway, that's, that's what I heard. Now you can buy, you can buy gasoline with no alcohol in it, and that's good for storage. Um, and, and again, you can use your, your phone, um, pure-gas, puregas.org. Um, I guess you can use your computer too, it's a website. But I, I know that you can get an app on your phone or something for it, so when you're out driving, and you have to, have to find some gasoline you can buy, you can find non-alcohol gasoline. Is that what you mean, Jeff, by, by recreational gasoline, the, the non-alcohol? Yeah. Yes. So you, you would recommend it in season and in storage? As, as often as you can get it. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's easily available, I don't, I don't know about driving 30 miles to buy it, you know, but 
Yeah. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so Art Rankin is, um, is got a 78 MGB and he's getting a loud clunking sound from the rear axle. He's replaced the thrust washers um, and it got quieter for a while, but now it's getting louder again. So Art, do you have disc wheels or wire wheels? Wire wheels. Wire wheels, okay. So my guess is it's probably the wire wheels that are making the clunk. Here's how to tell. Um, jack, jack the car up, put some jack stands underneath it, get somebody to go inside, um, I, to sit inside, put their foot on the brake like in this emergency stop, make sure that those rear drums are, are, uh, are absolutely frozen, and take the wheel, take the wheel, grab both sides of the wheel, and rock the wheel. Chances are the wheel moves independently of the spline. To repair this, of course, is only um, a new wheel and and the cost of, of, a, of a new um, hub, which is 150 bucks. So what do, you, what do you got there? 500 bucks a corner, something. It's awfully it's awfully expensive. Um, so you can test your your five wheels by running your finger down the inside of the splines, and you'll feel the ridge. Where the where the splines go to being unworn, there's about a I don't know a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more, of the of the spline that just it doesn't contact anything, so it remains unworn, and you can feel that ridge. So there's no magic way to measure it. Never measure it. I never figured out how to measure it. You can measure the hub, um, but you can measure the inside of the wheel just with your finger and just pick the two out that seem to be worn less. If you buy a new hub for the rear and put an old wheel on it, it'll have a shorter life than if you put a new wheel on it. And you should change the hub and the wheel at the same time. In the end, does it make an awful lot of difference? No, not, not, not really. Um, you can keep, you know, beating the spinner, but that doesn't do anything because within 20, 30 miles, it it sets up at where it wants to be naturally, which is loose. Okay. So that's... That could be, it could be, um, the, the, I know one of my rears is a new hub and a uh, new wheel, but the other one was original. Uh, so I, I don't know how old that is. So. And you know from changing those, those washers inside the di differential that the hemispherical one is copper, but the other one is phenolic, whatever that means, plastic. And yeah. maybe that's already chewed up, you know, who knows. I, I tried to get, um, years and years ago, I tried to get um, one of the major suppliers to, um, to offer that in copper. Why not? I mean, it's just, it's just a die cut. Um, and maybe there's something out there that's already available. Um, but we didn't ever get there. So th that's, that's a real problem with the MGB diffs being clunky. If it's clunky on the inside, it's just offensive. It doesn't really hurt anything. But out on the wheels, eventually, over a long period of time, the splines on the hub wear away, and you can get into the, into the situation that if you hit the car at the brakes extremely hard, the brake drum stops, but the wheel keeps turning and then unscrews the spinner. That's, I've seen that only a couple of times. So a normal hub is 2.450 inches across. And as it wears, um, it gets less and less. And it gets to um, uh, 2.440 and it's clunky and the 3.0, 2.0, 1 by the time it hits uh, 3.90 instead of 2.50, it's dangerous. It takes a long, long time. Some people say, oh, you gotta look at the splines and are they sharp or are they rounded? It's like, dude, just put a caliper on it. You know, you can tell. Is there any chance to get the pinion back? What's that? Is there any chance to get the just, just a second, I, I gotta mute. All right, uh, you're gonna have to re, um, yeah. re yeah, here we go. 
Is there any, is there any chance it could be opinion bearing? No. No? No. Okay. That's easy. <laughs> That's okay. easy. If the, if the opinion, you know, the, the opinion is always turning true. Um, and uh, it, it never, it never changes its position. If the bearing fails, then, then the pinion will tip, will tip, say that the drive shaft, I gotta get a green screen behind me, this is crazy. Um, um, here, hang on just a second. Um, can I go to no background? I don't know how to go to no background. So anyway, so I, I got my screen here. Um, anyway, if the pinion is, is always turning true on a, on a center line, if the bearing fails and then it starts to, move depending on whether you're accelerating or decelerating and that's where you get that whine okay. an acceleration or de deceleration so no that wouldn't be that wouldn't cause a smoking sound correct correct okay. chances are it's the wire wheels John, it's yeah, thank you okay no uh, right beside your video control there's an up arrow if you click well on you that, know i i see that peter but um change, change your background Choose change your background and then yeah I got change my background but it, it there's no oh here I see video yeah and, there okay all yeah. right yeah so that that that's there better maybe, maybe I'll, I'll I'll run that for for a while you can see my tape recorder um hey John oh, uh, yes uh Guido here yes my I got my 1970s got the original wire wheels mm-hmm and um it's got tubes and i can't put tubeless tires on those right not on wire wheels you can by cleaning the wire wheels off absolutely the inside of them and then taking a, a tube or two of silicone goo and covering up where every single spoke is oh okay okay yeah don't don't do that because then no, when you no. get a leak you can't find it so let me ask you a question if i'm going if i stay with the, if i stay with the tubes stay with the there, tubes is there any special kind of tire that i have to buy then you can't you can't buy a tubeless tire anymore you buy a tube type tire and you get the thick you get radial tubes you get the thickest tubes you possibly can um, and and you can go to a motorcycle shop and they can install install. That's the, what I do. I go to a Harley yeah. shop here. Yep. Now, is there any tires you recommend for that? Um, uh, I just I just looking for tires for my daughter's car, and I went on to Universal Tire out of Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I went on to Coker Tire from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and you can still buy a Michelin XZX for like. 200 bucks each so that's you know thousand bucks for the guys a little much um and I, I guess they remake them or something i obviously they're not well, I, got dun I got dunlops on there now those are really no those are often really noisy um um yeah i mean that's with the car i bought the yeah, car but you can you can find you know you're, you're going for a um a one 175 or 185 slash 70 14. So you, you on don't, original don't, rims on the original yeah, rims. Yeah, don't don't get one ninety fives or two oh fives or something. That's just way too big. But um, so okay, so you don't like the Dunlops? Uh, well, it, it's if they're on there, but you know once. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, I'm gonna need. They're getting dry rotted. I'm gonna need yeah. new tires. Yeah. So there's no nothing other than the Michelin's you recommend. I'll um. Send, send me a note on, on email and, and I'll, I'll see if I can re remember which tires I, I'll, I'll look and see which tires I got for my daughter. So, All right, cool. Okay. John, can I interrupt for a second? Hey, Skip, yeah. Um, if somebody's gonna put tubes in, in, your or in your tires, make sure they remove the stickers. They seem innocuous, but they will in time wear okay. the tube down and poof, it's happened to me, and I've seen it reported that it's happened to others. Okay. Sticker to, on the tube? The can, the, on the tube. Uh, they're, they're manufacturers, <laughs> uh, quality control stickers or something. Oh, like okay, that. okay. And yeah. But they, what they do is they don't slide back and forth with the tire inside the, or the tube sliding back and forth inside the tire. 
as a result, that spot wears. Chafes it, yeah. It happened to two or three of my tires, uh, and one was destroyed, lit, left me out in the woods without a tire. <laughs> and um, the other one was caught before it, it actually died. But whoever puts it in, make sure those tags are off, or you'll, mm -hmm. you'll notice it later. Cool, thank you. Okay, so I, I, I actually do have hair. Um, our, our next one up is from uh, Mr. Edwards, K. Edwards, um, and he answers his own question. He says, there is no trick to taking the water pump off an MGA, right? And right. That, that is correct. There just isn't, you gotta take, you gotta take the radiator out. There's just no, no way around it. Oh, you do have to take the radiator out. That's yeah. what I was, I didn't know yeah. that. That's why I'm yeah, asking. That, and then it's just straightforward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so nice. is leaking in a, you know, the, the antifreeze is running off the middle crossbar on the bottom of the car. Okay. And so I thought it felt like it's one of those, that little short tube up towards the top. I thought it was wet behind there. So I've changed all the, um, the hoses, but it's still leaking. So I assume yeah. and the, and the water pump's not making any noise, but I assume it's just the seal. Because it's the same one since I think the car's original. Um, <laughs> okay. There are two things that go wrong with a water pump. One is the bearings fail and one is it leaks. And you can have one that uh, you can grab a hold of the fan and twist the fan back and forth and clunk, clunk, clunk. It's just like, oh my gosh, and it doesn't leak a drop. And there's other ones that, you, that are absolutely firm and feel perfect mm -hmm. through and leak just horribly. So sometimes it just leaks when it's running. Sometimes they leak when they're when they're turned off. It, you, you never know. So it is the whole water pump and seal both replace both while I'm in there. The just buy a whole new water pump, and when you get the water pump, of course you got to have the gasket, and just use grease on the gasket. Grease the gasket and grease the bolts. Just gob it with grease. Both sides of the gasket. Yeah. Just yep. Absolutely. Yep. And that that's uh, make sure you got a nice clean mating surface. Uh -huh. um, and um, and then next time you go to take it apart, it'll come apart like a dream. Okay. Sorry, it's not a very complicated question, but I'm a, no, not a fancy hey, mechanic, so. Hey, hey. And then John, one more thing too. I asked you a few weeks back about, I don't know if you remember about the light switch on my car. It was- Yes, and I was wrong. I was wrong about that. It wasn't wired backwards. I felt guilty about answering that ever since. Well. And I, when I looked under there too, it almost looks like the switch is maybe one like the map light switch. I, are those alike, identical, those two switches? Well, the map light switch is on off, push pull. And the headlight switch is a, is a three position, off, intermediate, and on. Mm -hmm. So I just don't understand why it would go off when yeah. you push it in. So I took those off and there were only two wires on mine. I think you mentioned three, but and then I reversed them, switched them around, but nothing changes. Right. Um, there should a, a, on a on a headlamp switch on an MGA, it should be um, there's a brown and blue is your power, mm -hmm. um, and then the first step is the reds, which is your parking lights, and the second step is the blue, which then goes to the dipper switch. John on mine, which I think is original. To get it to the headlight, you have to, after you pull it out to the first stop, you have to turn it almost a quarter turn to pull it to the second stop. Right. But what Mr. Edwards um, complained yeah, about a month or two ago was that when his is out, it's, it's off and he pushes it in and it's on. It's like, what, you know, what's going on there? I, it's not the right switch. <laughs> That's it. So you, you can, you, you can find a, uh, you can buy a new switch always, um, but maybe you can go on eBay and find a used switch. Yeah, I think it's around thirty dollars at Moss or so. It's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it, installing it is is the more difficult part. It actually comes off pretty easy. All I did was turn off the out, outer ring and it just slipped out. But you know, I have to take the knob off too. With it, and it has a little push button under the right. knob. You know, right. So, yeah. Yep. Well, I'm, you're, you look younger than some of the other guys here, you know, and, and when you go, go to hook up the wiring, you know, you end up standing on your head on the, uh, underneath the dash or something. So. Yeah, yeah, that's awkward. You have to bend over that. And so I put a rubber something over the, you know, the uh, right where you climb over the car there, you know, the wheel well there, because that's sharp. 
or you know, not the wheel well, but you know, the entrance into the car, that's a sharp yes. little edge of mine and there's yes. no rubber on that. Yeah. If you go to, if you go to Home Depot, you can buy those mats. They're about uh, oh. um, two foot by two, two foot. Oh, I'm watching this. I'm going to mute everybody here. And just because, and Edwards, you can uh, unmute yourself a little. Yeah, HMAC it's Kevin, 3. By the way, yeah. Um, I'm trying to un, I'm trying to mute you, HMAC 3. Um, trying to. Um, and um, anyway, you can go to Home Depot and you can buy those interlocking mats. And those are just great for, for putting down beside the car to kneel on or, or over the sill, you know, so when you're leaning in there, um, you're not killing yourself. So, hey, can okay. I interject something real quick? Crystal, yes. Uh, I was on eBay looking for my own light switch for my 70 MGB. Yes. And I saw about a week ago a new old stock switch for the MGA. And I saw that and I knew he was looking for it, but I didn't know his screen name. So tell him to check. Uh, I don't remember if it was the eBay US or eBay UK, but do a check on eBay. It might still be up there. Okay, I'll take expensive. a look, thank you. It Is was it? expensive. Oh, well again, I can get a new one, looks like from Moss Motors for about 30, so I don't know. Well, yeah, but I'd much rather have new old stock than the, my problem that I'm hearing is the new ones that are got Lucas Nables on them, oh. just like John was saying, made in China. <laughs> They're not everything made in China's fault. I only hope the Chinese military is using the same suppliers that supply our, our <laughs> retail out outfits, and we won't have anything to worry about for a while. So, okay, all right, thanks, everybody. Okay, so now we're going to move on to uh, John uh, Avalone looking for recommendations from the group the best brand for a home garage floor jack for a 72 MGB, a trolley jack, jeez, um, eBay, no, Craigslist, Craigslist, really, go on there, you can buy a good, somebody's used one for 50 bucks, you know, or you can go, go to Napa, I, I bought a little one at Napa, works just, just fine, so, but, if anyone else wants to weigh in on what they do. Yeah, used. this is Rich. I got a beautiful aluminum one out of Harbor Freight for $100 that weighed a third of my old cast iron one. I don't know why I didn't do it 25 years ago. <laughs> because all that stuff from Harbor Freight comes from the same place as Crystal's, Crystal's a headlight switch. Yeah. It, it's, got clutch, two, yeah. it's got two pistons in it. it um, okay. And John, I just bought I just bought the Harbor Freight the, their race their race floor jack uh, Ooh, for fifteen dollars, and it's much lower. I had no problem getting under the, the front of the MG. Okay. Um, Same one. And, okay, and you know, for for as much as we use our jacks at home, yes, you're probably fine with it. Just remember, jacks are for jacking. And you must always use a jack stand. And I know Harbor Freight had a recall on there. Somebody told me. I don't know for they, sure. They, Some, they had a recall um, on, on a couple of different numbers. I think they probably replaced all those, but yeah, I've got right. Harbor Jack stands and and I, I, they're fine because I'm here talking to you. I may find out one day. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> so far they're good. Okay. All right, John, John that, that should answer your, your question there. So, John. Yes. Not, not a Jack stand, but I bought an engine stand off of eBay or not eBay, uh, Facebook for like $25. Yeah. I was selling one and my plan is once I put my car back together, I'm going to sell it to the next guy for 25 bucks. I, so I'm, those, those deals are out there. They are out there. I bought a, I bought a rototiller for 75 bucks because to rent one for half a day was the better part of that. And, um, I've had it for a year and I, I got a little tiny bit more to do in my lawn and then it's done and that'll go back on Craigslist. So, uh, John, speaking of uh, engine stands, I've got my MGTD block out. Hopefully I'll get it back from the uh, machine shop at the end of this week. I was given a perfectly good engine stand, but I can't figure out any way to Don't. hook. I, okay, I, I, it looked it like it was gonna work. 
build it on a table. I'm, I'm, I, I don't, I, I was talking to Rich Caldwell the, the, the other day, I think I was talking to Rich and, and I said, I just, I don't like engine stands. I've never heard of one breaking ever, ever, but the things out there, you go to pull it, you know, you go to torque something and the whole engine stand moves and yeah. I said, nah, just put it on I the table. I just couldn't top. see that block being cantilevered out like that. It just didn't look right to me. Okay. I'll wait give it away. You, wait till you see those monster V8 engines dangling out there. You know, it's like, oh my gosh. So Kurt Hoffman says he bought a, a Daytona three-ton low-profile jack from Harbor Freight to get under his new Corvette. His new Corvette. And, and he's satisfied with the quality. So maybe that Daytona three, that sounds like the race, the race, um, that's got a race. So, and Martin Goldfarb, um, that was a long time ago. Your back uh, background is looking like a mirror. I don't know. I've got to talk to, now let's see. Doug, Doug is weighed in here. And he said, do I need the thick MG nuts on the head bolts or can I use ones from the hardware store grade eight? I go for the thick ones and there's nothing wrong with the old ones unless you've lost them or unless they're stripped out or something. The, the nuts are, are just fine, but I, I'd go for the, I'd go for the tall ones. I, I really would. Um, I've never, I've never tried to use a, a grade eight normal kind of three eighths fine nut on there. Um, I'd put the th thick ones on for sure. So, and here we go from Gene Cooper. Uh, times two for Harbor Freight. So um, anyway, and uh, John John Avaloni says uh, thanks for the recommendations. He's got to change a fuel pump, which is located uh, behind the rear wheel. It's in, located in front of the rear wheel, but yes, you got to jack it way up. And and no matter what you do when you're changing a fuel pump, you're going to end up with gasoline that runs down your arm and and into your armpit. That's just the way it is. So disconnect the inlet line um, with the outlet from the tank. Disconnect that first. Disconnect that. And then and then at least it won't siphon out. So and Kurt Hoffman says uh, he's still got his last harbor freight jack that he bought 40 years ago. And everybody's everybody's had um, a lot of okay. An old HF aluminum floor jack. So we've got a lot of a lot of um, um, people weighing in here about jack. So apparently the harbor the harbor freight ones, the aluminum ones are light. They work. Steve Olson. I use a wire screen for the bottom of my charcoal canister. Um, in in the past, he said I've used a paper towel, probably on top of the of that, and both work at least for a while. So, Steve, haven't talked to you for a while. Uh, and and um, Gene Cooper has over on the chat section, which you can access here, um, he weighed in at 7.15 p.m. Uh, Gene's got a, um, a, a place to go to purchase that USB port that Rich Caldwell talked to me about earlier. Uh, if you want to install a, um, a USB port. Oh, here we go. Yeah, here's hey, John, I'll chime in on that for a second. Okay. The one I had, it drew uh, 75 milliamps for just for the little light in it and the coils inside for the uh, voltage reduction. So I had to put that, uh, I had to come back and put that uh, button switch on and off so it wouldn't drain the battery. But I didn't, I, I, if I could have got one without a light, I would have done that because, but apparently even the, the the voltage drop circuitry in there will draw some type of uh, a current. It's but amazing, you, it... you know, you go 75 milliamps. I mean, get your calculator out and do it. And it's like your battery ought to last for the next three years, but it doesn't, it doesn't. And radios, radios with a memory uh, for presets, that'll draw, draw your battery down to zip in two weeks. Um, it, I don't understand how su such a low load can do that, but I do know that it does. So you should, if you're going to put that uh, cigarette lighter voltmeter in, which I've got in my TV, but I've got it on the switched circuit, not the unswitched yep. circuit. Yep. So no when problem. I shut it off, it's not draining the battery. Yep. 
That makes lots of sense. Sure. I uh, didn't. I didn't want to go through. I didn't want to wire it up uh, for all that vibration and road wear because I, I still have a positive ground system, and I thought, you know, just my luck. A stone or a chip or something underneath and then i'll have some issues so i just tunneled in uh you know bore through the wood behind the uh the seats in the mga and it's a short hop to the battery and that way i didn't have any um uh problems i, I can't see any future problems with uh the, the, the wiring getting messed up and causing a, an issue with the positive ground versus negative ground yeah, but remember the uh, the the um, oops, wrong button. Uh, that if you're using one that's got a metallic housing that's ground, you got to make real sure you put it oh, in yeah. wood and not into metal. And I'll well, off of here. that's the beauty of the MGA. It is wood behind the seat. All right, I'm gonna leave this and uh, mute everybody here for a minute, and then we're gonna go to Joe. Uh, uh, Oh my gosh, it's so horrible to mispronounce someone's name. It, it's all right, John. The last name's Jaselnik. Jaselnik. Okay, thanks. Okay. So um, Joe's asking about, about timing on his car, and he goes, Oh my gosh, when I set mine at 32, um, car won't run very well. So remember that when you set it at 32, you set it at full mechanical advance which is usually up around three or 4,000 RPM vacuum disconnected. So you put a timing light on it, you have somebody else, depending on the year and model you got, somebody else rev the engine up until it quits advancing. When it quits advancing, then it should be at 32. At 22 degrees before at 1,000 RPM is, is probably a little much, you, um, but, but it, you know, they have a have timing around 20, uh, 20 to, if the vacuum's connected, depending on the year and model, um, like a late model B, those things idle at almost 40 degrees before at around 1,000 RPM. That's with, the, with, that's with the vacuum connected. So um, you want to do this vacuum disconnected at full mechanical advance. That's the magic number, 32, on all of our cars except the twin cam. So um, TB even, or TC, or, or 1980 MGB, 32 oh. degrees before at full mechanical advance. Gotcha. Yeah, so I, I recently picked up the car and it was originally set for about 12 degrees at 1,000 RPMs. And okay. It, ran, it very difficult to start. Um, and so I started playing with it, was able to advance the time. It starts beautifully around 22 mm -hmm. um, at 1,000 RPMs. But I, 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 did, I don't dare run it like that, you know, with the, with the distributor I have. Um, I don't know if that's a, a combination of the high duration cam that came with the car. Or... No, um, no, the cam, the, the, everything, else, everything else has no effect on it at all. It only has to do with the distributor. Mm -hmm. And the weights in the distributor, and the springs in the distributor, and the total maximum advance. What what year and model do you have? You got a you got a uh, 1800 18 18G engine. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so you should be running a 40897 MGB distributor. They use that from 62 through 67. 40897. It's the best distributor you can get, um, and and um, that's got ten degrees of mechanical advance because it's distributor degrees. You double that, so that's twenty degrees of engine advance. So your static timing ought to be twelve degrees. Mm -hmm. But when it's running, um, I would think I. Um, um, 22 might might not be that that far off although usually I usually pick it up around 17 or something but do it do it at full mechanical advance because that's where it's got to be where where are your timing marks on the top of the car or the bottom of the car uh they are 
the proper ones are on the bottom of the car, but then I, I, I was able to find top dead center and make my own mark, so they're on the top of the car. Okay, now. well then you need to dial back timing light. Yep, got okay. one of those. Okay, so just disconnect the vacuum, shoot the gun at it, reach across, rev it up until it quits advancing. And at that point, it should be at 32. Gotcha, thanks John. Okie doke. Okay, uh, let's see, we're going to Mike Jansen. What's the difference mechanically between a 1600 engine and a 1622 MGA engine? Mechanically, you go from, well, the, the 1500 has got a bore of two and seven eighths. The 1600 has got a bore that's just decimal. And, and the um, 1622 has got a three inch piston. That's it, mechanically. That's the difference, except for um, the connecting rods. When they went to the 1622, they get a bigger wrist pin, gudgeon pin. Um, that's the difference, and that's common with the MGB um, three main engine, the 1800 engine. So you can run, um, as long as you get the rods, you can run, you can run whichever kind of piston you want in whichever ki kind of block you want as long as you got the rods that'll fit the pistons. So Mike Jansen, that is, um, that's the difference between the 1600 and the 1622. The rods and the diameter of the pistons. Oops, technical call. But I think I'll just turn it off here. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> Thanks, John. Thanks very okay. much. Yeah. Um, from Don Bueller, I saw that University Motors has a convertible top stretcher. Yes. So that's, is that on my website or I, I, don't, I don't know where you would have seen that. But anyway, we made that out of two by fours, you know, just a, a rectangle, a big rectangle. And we stretched the, the town cover on it like you'd stretch a hide on the side of a barn or something or other. Now we may have had as many as Oh gosh, uh, dozen, 18 um, turnbuckles um, made up out, out of twine and, and whatever long things we could get to tighten up the twine. And we put it out in the sun um, and, and you just tighten that thing up and, and you leave it out there in the sun all day and it'd get limp and you tighten them up more and then it'd get limp and you tighten it up more and it kept stretching, stretching, stretching until when you put the tonic cover back on the car, it would work great. So the secret to ha not having to do that is don't store the tonic cover in the winter in, in the boot, but to hang it up, let it, let it fall to its natural length. So anyway, we just scabbed it up out, out of two, two by fours. So Chris Savage, um, he says, I've, I've just had the, the carburetors, the HS6s on his MGC overhauled. However, when I started up from cold, it fires on one or two cylinders and takes a long time to slowly fire up on all six. Once hot, runs great. What's causing this reluctant start? Probably the fact that the jets aren't dropping far enough. So. Um, get, get someone in the driver's seat. Chris, are you on? Can you un unmute yourself? I mean, you, you can if you want. Um, get someone in the driver's seat and, and they work the choke. You, and you can't, re you can't get your fingers around a choke on a C. Those round buttons in that crack pillow dash, those things yeah. are like impossible. When was it, 72 that they went to the T handle? If you're Mr. Original, you got to put you got to put the original cable back on. But if you want ease of use, put the T handle on. Oh my gosh, get that T handle up up in there, and then you can get your fingers on it and pull it out because it comes out of the dash that far. It comes a long way out. So anyway, get your associate to pull that choke cable all the way out, and then you right. you're watching the jets on the bottom of the carburetors, and both the jets should drop at least a quarter of an inch. Okay. If they're dropping that far, it'll start smack, like they'd start in Antarctica. Right. 
Okay, I'll give it a go. Thanks very much. Appreciate now, when it. you put the when you replace that choke cable on an MGB dash um, from sixty eight through set seventy six, you can't get your hand up there. So the first thing you got to do is take the take the deflector control out. So it's like that. Uh, it's like um, the the pin and the in the you're gonna take the push in a pin and take the knob off and use a deep five eight socket. Get the nut off the control. Wrestle the control out of the back of the dash. Now you can get your hand up there, but you can't really get the um, you can't really get the nut loose or tight on the back of the choke cable unless you've got that handy tool. And I use this is that this is the com that complete uh, wrench that I I was so proud of for tightening up. Anyway, this is a line wrench, and that's what you need. Um, a line wrench to get on the, a three-quarter inch line wrench to get on the back side of that of that choke cable. Now the new nut that comes with the choke cable is about a sixteenth of an inch thick. You can't get on it, you can't get a wrench on it, get it cross-threaded, go to the hardware store and just buy a half inch fine nut. That's usually the thread that, that comes on those. Just a normal half inch, great big thick nut and use that instead. Now you can actually feel it, you can turn it and you can get your wrench on it and, and get it tight. So anyway, that's just a, an aside about changing the choke cable on those. Good stuff, um, thanks very much. Hey, you're very welcome. So now we've got from iPad 2, who's iPad 2? Talking about carburetors, does, does um, do worn throttle shafts affect the idle? Absolutely. Um, it leans it leans out the idle. It, it air is able to, to come between the throttle shaft. You know, if this is the throttle shaft and this is the pushing, air, air is able to, to go in there. So what do you do when you're tuning the car? You adjust the carburetor so it runs correctly at idle. It's sucking in all kinds of extra air at idle. So you end up adjusting the carburetor's rich to account for this extra air at idle. Now, when you're running down the road at 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, um, that air leak is negligible. It has no effect at all, but those carburetors are still adjusted too rich. So yes, it does have an effect uh, on idle. It leans it out and over a period of time, it just makes sense to change them. Um, sometimes when they get really bad, you, you know, you let your foot off the throttle and it's idling at 1100 and the next time you let your foot off the idle, it's idling at 800. Um, it just, it's all, all, all over the place. You can get those rebushed. I can rebush them. Um, uh, I got the tools. So um, lots of people do that. Oh, he saw, and then he, he weighs back in and says, sounds like a reason to buy a lathe. You don't need a lathe. All, all you need is a, um, Joe Curto sells it. Um, maybe Moss sells it too, but a, uh, a piloted reamer. Sort of silly to buy a tool for 100 bucks or 38 bucks. Or, it depends on how, how much it is for a one time use. Um, but anyway, that's uh, lots of people can re rebush those. So, from Cindy talking about gasoline, I can get 104 leaded gas. No, you can't get leaded gas. That No, but you can get. Um, um, you can't get, you can get 104 octane maybe, but there isn't leaded gas out there unless it's still at the airport. Um, or non-ethanol, un unleaded, which is preferred. Um, I just don't believe you can buy leaded gasoline. It's tetraethyl lead is illegal. Um, but non-ethanol, unleaded is, is fine. If you can get 104 octane, oh my gosh, go go for it but you don't need it if if the compression ratio is below 11 to 1 you, you just don't need it i i run my mga has got pretty good uh, pretty good compression in it like 11 to 1 or something and i i just buy the 92 or 93 that's um alcohol gasoline that whatever's available at the pump and it seems to run just just fine um when the when we lost the lead in the gasoline in 1975, it's been a while. 
Um, everybody said, oh, no, we're not going to be able to drive our cars. You know, the cylinder heads are going to all fail and everything. Well, it turned out to be much ado about nothing. Well, not really. The, the cylinder head, the seats were a little faster. So everybody started using these phosphor bronze guides uh, because the cast iron guard, guides weren't going to work. Well, that was a mistake. The phosphor bronze guides, you have to open up to two thousands. And the cast iron guides were running at, one, at half a thousands. Uh, and, and the problem with the phosphor bronze guides is they swell a lot, they'll, 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 they'll collapse and catch the valve, gall the valve, the valve will stick open. Um, that, they aren't any good. Anyway, when you have your cylinder head redone, anybody, you always have seats, hardened seats installed in the head. The valves are the same. Um, you don't have to have those seats on the on the inlet valves because the inlet valves are not hot. They're always getting washed with an ice cold air fuel mixture. But the exhaust these exhaust seats, you always get those redone with hardened seats. Everything else stays the same. So you don't have to take your engine apart. You wait for it to wait, wait for it to fail. So so HMAC three says worn throttle shaft bushings or a worn throttle shaft will cause a vacuum leak, will affect the idle, um, and you, he's suggesting using carburetor cleaner uh, around the shafts to find out if there's a leak. There's always a leak. The question is how bad is it? So when you take the spray nozzle from your carburetor cleaner, good carburetor cleaner, a lot of carburetor cleaner isn't good anymore because the federal government required that the, the carburetor cleaner manufacturers take out the, uh, I don't know, methyl ethyl ketone or toluene or some, whatever made this stuff really, really hot stuff. Anyway, if you spray that around the throttle shafts uh, while the car's idling and you get any change in idle, then that indicates to you that there's something going on with a leak. Sometimes the idle will go up, sometimes the idle will go down, sometimes you can kill the engine, sometimes it just depends. You can use that between the head and the manifold, the manifold and the heat shield, the heat shield and the spacer blocks, the spacer blocks and the carburetors. You can use it on T-types, you can use it on late model MGBs. If you're looking for a vacuum leak, you spray, you spray good carburetor cleaner, ether, um, ar around any place where it might possibly leak, and oh my gosh, if there's a leak, you'll know immediately. So Dave Sylvain says, are tubeless tires safe to use with TD disc wheels? So um, between the MGA and the MGB, there was a safety rim incorporated into the disc wheel. Um, and if you talk to some people, say, so oh my gosh, it's not safe to run a tire without the safety lip on the wheel. But I've never talked to anyone who's run their wheel off their run their tire off their rim because it didn't have that safety lip on it. So yes, it is safe to run a tubeless tire on TD disc wheels without a tube. Yes, it is. So, um, Gene Cooper weighs in. He's in the airline, was in the airline industry, but that's, I don't even know if they use lead there. He was just commenting about the effects of tetraethyl lead on, on us. So. Um, has anyone ever made liners for the wire wheels? iPad 2. Has anyone made liners for the wire wheels? There's a rubber band that goes around the spokes, um, but an airtight liner, no. When you, buy, when you buy wire wheels now, you can buy tubeless wire wheels, and you look in the inside of them, and there's, there's a, a, a tube or two of silicone goo, which has been smeared around, around where the, the, the nipples of the spokes are. And um, um, that works great until it starts to leak. And then how do you seal it up? It's like trying to find a, a leak on a flat roof. <laughs> so um, there, there aren't, as far as I know, there aren't any liners for that. And if you have the silicone in there and then get sick of it and want to put in tubes, you got to get all that silicone out of there. Um, and gasoline dissolves silicone. I, I don't know how you get it out of there. Better, 
better just to use those rubber bands and tubes that you've removed the labels from and a lot of um, baby powder. That's, that's what we, ba baby, just a ton of talcum, talcum powder on, on the inside. So, so from Gordon to er everybody, many years ago, I parted out a bee, 1965 bee, I think. I still have the bonnet, boot, front wings, and here we go, wings are rough. And he, he's, uh, he's, a t he's an MGA, he's an MGA guy. So he's got no interest in these. Anyway, he lives in Greenwood, Indiana. So if you want to contact Gordon, send me a note. Gordon, you can send me a note and say that you've got this stuff available. And if anyone's around Greenwood, Indiana and wants a bonnet, a boot lid, those are hard to get rid of. Front fenders, those are, those are hot um, because the, the new ones, even at the price that they're being sold at, are only starting point. It's easier to start with a, with a remanufactured front fender than it is with a sheet of metal, but um, you still have to work with those a lot. So anyway, so if anyone wants those. So here we got Bob Moran to everybody. Are the paint codes available for the original paint colors for MGs? They're in the Moss Motors catalog. But the problem is that most paint, I mean, ever since my wife, Caroline, late wife, Caroline, put that list together, which is probably 1985, um, um, and then we sent it out to Moss and Moss is incorporated into their catalog and they, and they thank her in the catalog for that. The problem is that the, the, they've got old Ditzler numbers, DuPont numbers on them. You can go to Anders Clausiger's, the original MGB. They've got ICI numbers in there. The problem is that those numbers are all so old that, that you can't translate them into modern paint codes. So um, I talk about Paul Deershaw a lot. It's Sports Car Craftsman in Arvada, Colorado. You know, there's a, a panel behind the front wheel um, that, that keeps all the crap from the front wheel getting slung into the inside of the fender on the, on the, MG, on the MGB. Maybe Paul's got the MGA ones too. And he's got, I think, maybe not Caribbean blue, but he's got almost, if he doesn't have all the colors, he's got almost all the colors of the MGB on the back side of those of those panels. <laughs> so he still has um, unmolested paint. And so he might be somebody to contact. So it, it's it's hard it's hard to come up. And T types, um, you know, it's a uh, you know a, a T D red. Yeah, we sold uh, that was available for years. Matter, M-A-D-D-E-R, Matter Red, 71993 remember stuff you know but it, but those uh, that a ditzer code just doesn't get you anywhere so um anyway now gene cooper's just weighed in here not just he weighed in at 742 um and he says should you spin the water pump with a drill before installing it i've never heard of that and if you're going to spin it with a drill then wouldn't you put something in it to to put it, uh, are you trying to seat seat the seal against the against the back of the impeller so i'm not sure gordon way his weight in here um uh he's he's the guy with the fenders um and his email address is really simple fog f-o-g um 1970 at aol.com so if you're interested in his boot, his bonnet, or his front fenders, or you want to talk about TR3s or something, get in touch with Gordon at FOG1970 at AOL if you're around Greenwood, Indiana. Andy says, just type the MG colors in your search engine. Somebody else has already done it. Somebody else is already out there and has painted their car and, and you know, who knows? Who knows? So now we got Mike Jansen again, and he's asked, um, I, was this the same question? The difference between a 1600 and 1622 is the length of the connecting rods the same? Yes, absolutely. It's just the diameter of the gu gudgeon pins. 
And here we go. Here is a link over in the chat section from mgcars.co.uk um, with paint codes in it. But again, I don't know if those are paint codes. You can actually go down to your paint store and say, here, here's the paint that I want to use. But it's over in the chat section. And it's also on mgcars.org.uk. All right, Doug Miller. I just drove my 1980 MGB at night and noticed my speedometer is not lit. The other gauges are. I haven't got into it yet. Any special tricks to replace the bulb? No, it's really pretty easy. You can get your hand back up in there because the heater controls are down on the, con on, the, on the console. It's really easy. Just, you know, you can't see what you're doing in there. Um, sometimes I'll tell people, take a mirror and go down there and just look so you can see the back of the gauge and the, and the, the bulb that you're after is powered by a, a, a red with white wire. Just take a look. Chain the flashlight in the mirror if you have to, as so you can see the back of it. You can't use the mirror when you're working because you just can't, it just doesn't work. So <clears throat> look at what you're trying to do and then um, reach up in there and just do it with your eyes closed. So. Screw it, screw it, John, screw in bulb or pushing? Oh, 1980 MGB. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a Wagner 1447. I don't think it's a screw in. I think it's a, is it? Oh my gosh, I don't know. I'm so embarrassed. I know the part number for the screw in bulb is a 1447. It's a, it's a Lucas 987. I know that. But is it a screw in bulb? I don't know. I don't know. If it's a second thing to go, John. Thanks, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Something um, as simple as a light bulb. I, you know, oh, wait, 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 wait. Okay. Oh no, that's, uh, I've, I've got a cross reference. Um, I'm gonna mute, I'm gonna mute everybody because I got some background going on there. So, um, Doug, you can unmute yourself again. Um, um, so, anyway, and all of us with rheostats know that the three positions are dim, flicker, and off. I don't know why there's a dash rheostat. The dash lights are never bright enough. I know that the Little British Car Company was selling LED bulbs um, that uh, four dashes. And I don't know if there's a replacement for that 1447 screw in or not. I don't know. No. Well, once I get the bulb out, I'll be able to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. If, if it's if it's a screw in with a miniature Edison thread then you go to Napa and ask them for a 1447. I know that, so. All right, thank you, John. Okay, Doug, I'm gonna mute everybody again, just so that we don't get any background. Bob Moran says, thanks for all the paint code stuff. Um, oh yeah, the change in the bulb. Gene Cooper's weighing in a lot here. Thanks, Gene. Um, he says, you need little hands or a neighbor's kid. Um, okay, Bob, Bob Simon, here we go. Here's a good one. I need to replace my clutch master cylinder on my 75B. I rebuilt it seven years ago, but it's bad again. Are the replacements with the smaller reservoirs okay? That's the one that I didn't want to use on my daughter's car. I, I just, I, I've heard people complain about it. So um, they've got, generally speaking, they probably are okay. Bleeding them, you gotta. You get, it's almost a three-person job because they run out of fluid so fast. Um, but maybe it's still okay to rebuild the one that you've got. And I don't know. I've, I've done. I did that once already, and mm -hmm. uh, it's leaking again. Thankfully, I used DOT five so that my really neatly recently painted engine bay did not get stripped of paint. You know, but Dean Hickenlooper, who's on this call too and lives in Clarendon Hills. He did it in his bees, and uh, I've not heard that he's had trouble okay. or problems. Okay. But I was curious about, you know, any supplier that would do better, or they're all going to be buying no, I, I the think, same ones I, from China? I, I think they're all, I think they're all, all the same. It's, it's, um, they're ugly to look at, but, <laughs> they're, you know, they're like 37 bucks, and the AP ones, which I think are on back order, 
which probably means it won't be available again. I don't know. You know, those are like 175 bucks. And the one that I had resleeved was $245. So yeah. those are those are all options. Yeah, well, I mean, the one that's 100 and a half, do we really think it's going to be machined better and will last a long time? No, it just, it just looks right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oak. All right. So here we go. Um, um, let's see from Chuck to everybody. Very true on light replacement. Also, just replace all of them with LEDs. It'll be the first time you'll ever be you will have ever been able to see your gauges at night. And that's and that is a comment. If you go in to change one bulb, just change them all. Um, because um, you know, like just like in a factory, when they go in to change the fluorescent bulbs, they don't just change them individually. They usually come in and 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 t take them all out and, and change them all at one time. Um, we did, we changed the bulbs on an MGC a number of years ago, and the bulbs were all, the inside of the bulb was all black. You could, you, you light them up with a test, you know, with test leads, and they, they, uh, they had this funny look to them. Um, so no wonder the guy couldn't see what was going on. I mean, that's 1968. That's a much older car, but um, anyway, so it should change all the bulbs at, at once. Dora says, Napa has a bunch of jacks available for a hundred bucks or a little more. Don't buy a used one when you can get a new one. Um, and you're going to save yourself mi misery, um, meaning that if you buy a used one, it's, it's not going to work. So anyway, so maybe before you buy the used one, go out and roll it underneath your car and make sure it jacks your car up. Daniel, I'm looking to upgrade upgrade my rear brakes on my 79 MGB to disc. Don't. Don't. Take the money and buy your wife or your girlfriend some flowers. Buy her a trip to Aruba. You don't need better brakes. Um, there's nothing wrong with the brakes that are on, on our cars now. If you can drive down the road at 60 miles an hour and jump on the brakes and lock up all four tires... You don't need better brakes. You need better tires. Okay, and it just it's um, I, I I know they got the the Wildwood that Willwood um, um, front brake kits and the drilled brakes and all all that kind of stuff and it's it's it isn't necessary. John, um, but anyway, but which which kit to get? I just don't even have a clue. I don't know. I'll be up, I'm upgrading the motor, that's why. But the car weighs the same. Okay. Because I'm doing that, I'm doing the V6 conversion. Yeah, but, but you still, I mean, stopping from 80 miles an hour, you're still stopping the same mass. So, so just because you can accelerate faster doesn't mean that you need to decelerate faster because it stops okay now. I mean, that's just my, my no, feeling. I, no, I, I trust your feeling. Trust me. <laughs> I've been watching your videos a lot, and, you, and, and you're just awesome. You're, you're a great well, part okay. of the Thanks. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I was listening to NPR the other morning. I wake up to NPR. That's my, my uh, deviation from my normal news sources. And they were interviewing the, the head of General Motors, and they've got a new truck out, electric truck, that they call a Hummer. Yes. Does it look like a Hummer? I mean, why would you reuse a name? Anyway, he said, I can't believe it, that that thing does zero to 60 in three seconds. A truck, yep. a truck, three seconds. It's like a motorcycle. In 1964, the Jag E-Type, that, that was their claim to fame that it would do zero to 60 to zero in 10 seconds. I just can't believe that it's, it's uh, any, anyway. Yes. Uh, yeah, Daniel, I've, I've saved you lots of lots of trouble and lots of money here. So. I appreciate it. Thank you, John. Hey. Thank you. Okay, so, so Robert Connect um, was uh, apparently had weighed in before. I don't remember what the problem was, but the problem was not a starter motor. It was this flywheel. So what 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 year do you have? Robert? Uh, it's a 72, John. You remember you talked to me about the brakes freezing up, and I said, uh, the starter motor, I think that, uh, about a month ago, 
we got the brakes sorted out and then I couldn't get the shim set up. I had to replace the valves at your, yeah, I, I'm sorry, the, uh, oh boy. It's okay. <laughs> replace the, uh, replace the, uh, uh, the bearings because they were both bad on the left side. So I just couldn't set the shims up I, after four hours. So I, I had the car towed over to, uh, my friend over there in tuxedo and they, they did it for me. And I said, Oh, the starter got a starter problem too. Well, by the time when he tried to start it, he couldn't start it at all. And he pulled the starter out and he calls me up. He says the, uh, I had an aluminum flywheel in there and the ring gear separated. Oh, okay. All right. And fortunately, it didn't, fortunately it didn't go through the, the how the bell housing, but, uh, he had to pull the engine. I just got it back this afternoon. I just had him fix everything. I had enough. Yep. <laughs> but thanks I, I for all your help on it, by the way, my friend. I really, really did. But uh, it just, yeah. You know, I, I fortunately somebody had a flywheel uh, around a used one, which was in excellent shape. And I went down yesterday with uh, my buddy Roy, and we picked up the flywheel in South Brunswick, and then went up to Tuxedo to okay. give it to him. And I got it back this afternoon. But now the Cars pulling to the left when I hit the hit the brakes, and he redid all the brakes. Okay. So I'm gonna have so to go if back. It, and... If it pulls to the left when you hit the brakes, it's almost always. Well, you always do the simplest, easiest, cheapest stuff first. So you make sure it's bled out. I mean, he's gonna say, "Well, of course I bled it," but so I know something's, wrong. something's wrong. So that's the first thing you do, and if it's not that, it's the brake hoses. The brake hoses is all stainless steel. Well, I, okay, but the only reason it pulls to there's two things. It can pull to the right side, right? It can pull to the left, left like like right like side. turning the steering wheel. If it's pulling, because the steering wheel turns, and if you step on the brakes like really fast, and the wheel turns, yeah, that's the front brakes. Yeah. If yeah. if the if you if you step on the brakes and the car drifts to the left, it's, that's the... No, it pulls the wheel. Pulls the wheel. That's the front brakes and it's the hose. It's got to be the hose or, or how it's bled. Oh, okay. can, left or right? Left, uh, right well, uh, if, the, if the hose was plugged up, if the hose was plugged up, it would be the right-hand hose. But you know, always change them in pairs. Yeah, he, <laughs> he didn't change the one. He said they're staying with what I know. I just put a new one on the right side. I have the whole kit. Oh God, I'm gonna have to have him change it. I can't get that darn thing loose. Okay, I, yeah, well, I've never heard of a ring gear coming loose so, or failing. And then, and then you said he had an aluminum flywheel. Aluminum flywheel. Yeah, I'm not. I'm no fan of aluminum fly, flywheels. Um, I'm not either anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, the, um, when you're idling at the stop sign, you've got a certain amount of inertia in the flywheel. And when you dump the clutch, like Jim Campy was just showing me a moment ago, thanks Jim, the release bearing, <laughs> anyway. Um, when you dump the clutch, the inertia from the flywheel is enough to launch the car and get it going. But an aluminum flywheel doesn't have, doesn't have anywhere nearly the inertia in it. So you uh -huh. have to rev it up so that you don't stall it. And so then you gotta slip the clutch. Aluminum flywheels are for race cars. If you're gonna race your car, you, you gotta have an aluminum flywheel. Um, Cause those things are idling. At, it, you don't, you don't yeah. zero to, you don't start from zero. It, you're only changing the RPM out, out on the track. So it, it's for a different type of use. So, well, so. I go over and talk to them in the morning. Well, not tomorrow, okay. I guess I'm also about when, maybe Wednesday I'll go. Yeah, uh, pretty late. I'll go over and see him. Pretty late yeah. tonight to bother somebody. Okay, well, I'm yeah. going to go on to Scott. Nice, Lynn. John. Hey, thanks a lot, Robert. I'm going to go over to Scott Lynn, who said, don't replace the indicator light, the charging indicator light with an LED. And if you've got a TR6, don't change the turn signal light with an LED, because then it only works one way. But... Um, and then it's what's up with the buffering on the audio and the video, I don't know. Okay, um, I phoned everybody. I'm taking out my wiper motor on an MGA. 
can you encourage me? Well, I tell you, once they moved it over to the right-hand side of the dash on an MGB, it made it just a whole lot easier. Um, I, was at, I was at a NAMGAR event at the Indianapolis racetrack in, I don't know, when was that, 82 something. And, and um, Frank Tarplay, who had a MGA coupe from Alabama was there and his wipers worked intermittently and asked, and I was doing my tech stuff out in the parking lot. And so I turned on his ignition, turned on the wiper switch and jiggled the end of his, end of his motor and it, it would cut on and cut off. And I said, well, Frank, what you need are brushes. You've, you've worn the brushes out inside the wiper motor. And I, Mr. Big here says, if you can find a pair, I'll change them. He had a twin cam. There's no room to get in there. And he found a set of brushes. So I was put to the test. And I did change a set of brushes in an MGA wiper motor on a twin cam in a parking lot. So you can do it at home, but it's, it's really dicey. It's really dicey. So anyway, I don't know. You might have to take the pedal box out. I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a horrific job. You undo the gland nut so you can pull the wiper motor out without pulling the wiper rack out. But I mean, it's just, it's, Oh my gosh, nothing's more buried. Well, second gear synchro is deeper inside the car than, than the wiper motor, but you can do it, iPhone. You can do it. Just, just take, take your time, you know, turn on the radio and keep it clean and do one part at a time. Take one part out and clean it. Got it done, put it on the table so you don't lose it. Put it in a box, put it on a magnet, something or other, and then take, take the next part off. Oh my gosh. Uh, Steve Vale uh, is got a follow up. He says he says uh, he works at an airport, um, and he can buy a hundred a hundred octane low lead. Is it okay to run? Absolutely, absolutely, it is. I didn't know you could even buy tetraethyl lead in gasoline anymore. So, hey John, yes, yeah, I um, I work at an airport here in Granbury, and we sell a hundred low lead. In. Fuel. I run in my airplane. Uh, I run in my motorcycles, lawnmower, no ethanol. It runs real clean. Yeah. Um, is that if I can get that? You know, would that be preferred to putting regular unleaded in it? Sure. Okay. Sure. Just run it in there. Okay. Sure. It's a little more expensive. I think we're three fifty a gallon right now, but I mean, I can get it. You work there. You can get a deal on it. I um, can't. Uh, it's, called sump, it's called sump fuel. <laughs> I was um, uh, given a tank of that 100 low lead for my TD, and I could not see, and I was only one tank, so maybe not a fair test, but I couldn't tell any difference, and I just run the, uh, um, I run the non-ethanol, and really kind of, if we're going to, I'd like to know, I drive my cars a lot, so the gas doesn't sit in them for very long. If the gas doesn't sit in them for very long, is there anything wrong with the ethanol gas? No, I I, I run ethanol gas in my car all the time because I'm I I, I don't want to screw around with it. I just buy the ninety two octane stuff and I, I I drive it. If it sits for a long time, long long time, sometimes it's a little hard to start, but it'll start. It'll warm up. It'll go, it'll go. I found that it corroded the solder and the floats inside my carburetor on two occasions really yeah that well, happened, in, happened in the past but but you're in texas so maybe it's different uh, down down there thanks so. john <laughs> yeah steve very very welcome but remember when you're buying gasoline at at the airport or at the marina even though it's more expensive you're not paying road tax on it so right someone's watching you and they want to get you they'll get you for that <laughs> um, here's uh, Scott Reinhardt has weighed in and said MG <sighs> it's at 818 um, Teglerizer website MG Teglerizer website has all the MG colors 
So that that's cool. That's it's T E G L E R I Z E R. So you can find that over in the chat section. So Frank is weighed in here. Um, Frank uh, Cataldo, so for those that want to be able to look behind your dashboard, there are many scopes that you can buy. Connect wirelessly to your phone so you can look behind there. I suppose you could even buy your door uh, doorbell cam, huh? And uh, they got great re resolution and, and uh, LEDs for, for, for dark places. And, and uh, I, 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 yeah, so sure. And he says you can get them for 30 bucks. So if you want to figure out what's going on behind your dashboard, you can get some little camera hook up to your phone and there it is, Judd's, Judd's got it here. So that's uh, okay. So, yep, that's cool. That, that's cool. That's And it was given as a stocking stuffer. So I mean, they're cheap and it worked nice. Hey, great. So here's Schroeder. This is a good one. I've been looking for an MGA. A supposed deluxe was being offered, but there were several, th several things that suggested to me it was just a Mark II. The dealer asked why I thought it wasn't a deluxe, and I suggested that he pull the wheels and check for discs, and he found drums all around. I'm not sure what to think now. I know what to think now. Uh, it's not a deluxe, but if you go to the right front motor mount, you know, the, the MGBs have got, um, and the MGAs have got um, bolts on the motor mounts, two bolts on each side, on two sides that are adjacent to each other. The twin cam and the deluxe have the right front motor mount, two bolts at the front and two bolts at the rear, no bolts on the top. So that's a really, really good way to tell. Who knows what someone's done in the past? And if the deluxe has got drums all around it, what's the point of buying it anyway? Although there's nothing wrong with drum brakes. Drum brakes stop the car just fine. There's no advantage to disc brakes, except they don't fade. So, you know, if you're trying to stop, if you're trying to stop and you jump on the brakes, disc brakes don't stop any faster than drum, drum brakes. I, they, um, but, repeated use uh, and cost of production, disc brakes are, are better, but drum brakes are just fine. Um, but anyway, um, who knows what somebody might have re retrofitted at some point. Um, maybe if they put wire wheels on, you know, because they wanted to put wire wheels, they put drum brakes on. But um, anyway, it sounds to me like, um, like they're mistaken. And that's a kind thing to say for a used car dealer. Yeah, but I mean, even I mean, my Mark II non deluxe has discs on the front. Yes. Drums all the way around. Somebody's butchered something. Well, or it's a fifteen hundred. I mean, titles that we used to have minis come in. The minis that were built in I don't know, Brazil. I don't know. Minis would co come in, and you'd look at the engines and and so forth. You knew that they were built in the nineties. Um, but the title said 1958 Austin Healey, you know, which mean it, you know, which would mean a bug eye sprite. So, um, yeah, who knows? The titles have been jumped around and people have changed stuff. So, so Dave Sylvain writes in, here's, here's a, here's a mechanical one. Great. How loose should I set the valves for the first startup after a rebuild on an MGB engine? So Dave, I would say, first of all, um, you want to use break-in oil, get break-in oil, which is extremely high zinc. Everybody should be running high zinc oil anyway, but break-in oil is even higher zinc. The, the common oil that, that you can get at Napa, places like that, is Valvoline VR1, Victor Romeo 1, um, 2050. But break-in oil has even got more <laughs> zinc in it than, than the normal running oil has in it. And you want to get oil pressure before you start the engine for sure. So um, the, the poor man's approach is take the spark plugs out and spin the engine until the oil pressure gauge flicks. And then you know you got oil pressure. And then set the valves at 30. I'd set them at 30. Make them really loose. Start it up. 
do some light tuning on the on the carburetors so they're drafting about the same and let it run for 20 or 30 minutes just like that then retort the head re, um, um, readjust the valves down to whatever the cam manufacturer has asked you to do or or back down to down to um, 15 or 13 wh whatever the spec is if it's got um, bucket lifters it's a, if it's an 18 v engine 72 through 80 it's got bucket lifters you want a valve lash around 13 so but I, I'd set, set them at 30 to start yep. nice and loose so everything can spin that 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 startup is critical to engine longevity so what about the rpm on that two to three thousand well yeah two two grand just set the idle screws up you know, I have to sit in there with your foot on the throttle, just crank the idle screws, you know. Yeah. Sit, yeah. yeah. Well, just, just one, just one, one question. On the break-in oil, where yeah. can you get this? I've looked around, lo you know, locally. And um, well, you can, I was going online, but uh, we used to use, um, will this be the second time tonight? Um, Brad Penn. Brad P E N N Brad Penn oil, um, and they made a break in oil. If you've got an engine rebuilder around around you, that they'll have it. Just buy it from them. Okay. Um, hey John, this is Steve again. Is that yeah. mineral oil for the most part? I'm sorry. Say again. Is that mineral oil? You you mean versus synthetic? You know, um, you know, I own an airplane. I work at the airport, obviously. And when they do rebuilds on engines, the first break-in, I forget how many hours it is on a uh, rebuild um, engine, we use a, it's an aero shell. It's a mineral oil. It's straight mineral oil. That's what they use for break-in. I, do, I don't, um, you guys have got a whole different set of standards. Okay, just curious. Because when our engines fail, you just pull over to the side of the road. But when yours fail, so um, just pull it, over the side of the road. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I've never heard of breaking it. I, I I don't know. Okay. I think okay. that's the only thing that I I know. I run that Brad Pan now. Do they have a special oil for break in, or is it the regular Brad Pan? Um, no, it, there's a special. There's a uh, another one with a lot more zinc in it. The normal, the normal Valvoline VR one, the normal Brad Pan's got about twelve, thirteen hundred parts mm -hmm. per million of ZDDP. Um, but the break in oil, I, I think, is is e even higher. Hey, John. Yes. This, this is Rudy, but it says Dora on my screen. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, Purple makes a uh, break in oil. Now I used it, works really well. Royal think, purple. Royal purple? Yes, okay. correct. Okay. Are, are you from Canada? <laughs> no, sir. A beautiful oh. Pasadena, California. Oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Royal purple. Okay. So it, it's out there. You just, Dave, you're, you're just going to have to hunt around and, and find some. Okay. Thanks, guys. Sure. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm just going to buy the ZDDP and pour it in the oil. Just pour it in. Just a lot of extra. But now you're acting as home chemist, and you're not sure if your oil is going to absorb that zinc, if it's going to use it correctly. So even though that's an option, I would buy, I'd buy the break-in oil that somebody else has already formulated. So uh, from iPhone is getting a, a wiper motor out of an MGA all that difficult? Um, um, if, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what, what, uh, what's going on here, but if, it, if it's not working, if the motor's not working, we always do the cheapest, easiest, simplest stuff first. So, um, you know, you can hot wire it and see if, if that's the problem to see if, 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 you know, if there's a problem there, you can take the, you can take the wiper arms off the, the car and l let it free wheel. Um, if it's an issue about where it parks, you can loosen up the, the, the cover and, and chain. Um, 
change the, the, the position of the, of the can uh, on top, the, the, where, where it's got the, the um, parking wire attached because getting it out of the car is, is difficult. That, that's my memory. So uh, here, great, a, a mechanical one here. Um, Paul, to everybody, what's the best way to adjust MGB rear brakes? So I'll tell you the proper way to do it. You get under the car, um, you slacken off the handbrake cable. You need a 9 16 deep socket for that and a pair of vice grips and unscrew the brass nut a long way. So the handbrake cable is, there's no possibility of the handbrake um, confusing you on your brake adjustment. Then grab a hold of the handbrake cable, the inner cable, where it exits the, the sheath at the swing assembly on the rear axle. Yank it so it, it's, it, there's just, it, its position doesn't come into play at all. Then you need a, a quarter inch square socket. Um, that's what I usually use on the end of a swivel and a long extension and use a ratchet and you unscrew the adjuster all the way. Grease it up, just use normal number two lithium grease. Screw that adjuster all the way in until you can't turn it anymore. Don't break it off, you can. If you get it too tight, don't do that, but break it, uh, it, tighten it up until you can't turn it anymore, until turning is very difficult. And you'll find it turns quarter turn by quarter turn as it pushes the adjusters out. And, um, and then begin to slacken it off and, and turn it quarter turn by quarter turn until the drum runs free. Now, theoretically, the distance between um, fully tight and loose is one quarter turn, but in practice, it's usually two or three. Um, and then once that's all done, then go ahead and readjust the handbrake. So you can take the wheel off um, and just jack up one, one corner of the car, use a jack stand, please, and use a, an air conditioner tool, which is a, 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 there's an air conditioner tool that's available, a, a Cornwall, Cornwall tool sells them as an RB-404. Um, it's an air conditioning tool, but it's a ratcheting quarter inch. And it also has a 516 on it, so you can adjust the brakes on your midget also. Um, and then you just use it by, by hand behind, uh, behind the, the backing plate. But I always, I like to slacken off the handbrake cable because unless you're adjusting it and you know how it's adjusted, it comes to you, it's been someplace else for adjustment, somebody didn't know how to adjust it, and they see the nut on the, on the uh, handbrake and they'll just adjust up the handbrake until the rear brakes are adjusted. And that's the wrong way to, to, to do it. So Jim Campy, here, here we go, Jim. Jim or unless, unless Paul, Paul, you, are you still there? Are you, I heard some. Did you say the name of that tool was, the air conditioning tool? Oh, it was valve wrench. Cornwall sells it. It's an air conditioning wrench. And the part number, the Cornwall part number is RB, Romeo Bravo, 404. John, may I jump in here with something very funny? Yes. So when I worked in the hardware store in 1975, this tool that you use to turn the water on and off, which you probably can see, was $2.99. Hey, okay. It adjusts MGB rear brakes. Now, in 2020, it's 89 cents at okay. the same store. <laughs> okay. It's just unbelievable to see you again. Thank Fred, you. it's a pleasure. Last time I saw you was at my house on Buttrick. Was... And I remember the, the directions you gave me. I still tell the story. You told me when you get to the big sweeper, you make the left. And I said to all my friends, only John Twist would give directions <laughs> like when you get to the sweeper. <laughs> Anyone else would use a landmark. 
It's yeah. just absolutely amazing. Anyway, 89 cents. If you get the Chrome one for $1.29, your car will go faster. Fred, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Now I'm going to switch from Fred down to Jim. And Jim's got a, a, a release bearing um, that he's going to hold up in front of him here. And that looks, to me, that looks like a brand new, to me, that looks like a brand new release bearing. So I don't, I don't know how much is supposed to be on there. I just don't. Um, yeah. We've been, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now and uh, yes. either yeah, buy a new one and let it go or go with this proven one that has this thickness on it. And, and I don't know what kind of thickness the new ones have. And that, if you tell me this looks like it's wore out or it's that good. Looks, that looks almost new to me. All right. Great news, John. So, um, so there was, um, uh, you can use that in your MGA and, 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 um, and, and like Crystal was, was talking to us about, you know, it's a whole lot better to use an original part than, a, than the Chinese part. I agree, I agree. Well, thank you very much, John. Oh, you're very welcome, thanks. Um, you, can, you can install an MGA clutch in an MGB, in, excuse me, an MGB clutch in an MGA but it requires changing the, the flywheel and it requires changing the front cover on the, on the gearbox. So it's not an insignificant amount of work, but you get a much, much improved clutch. How about the, uh, how about the input shaft? Um, you, um, that stays the same because your, en your engine and gearbox have stayed the same, but you have to use a flywheel from a, from a, uh, an MGB, um, a three main, a three main flywheel because it's got three pegs to lo locate the um, the clutch cover. An MGA o only uses two, um, and then you you got to use the front cover and the and the and the fork from an MGB gearbox. You can't just put a, a B um, fork on an MGA gearbox because the, the MGB gearbox, the position of the fork is moved, the, the resting positions moved. I have, I have all those components you just mentioned, so do you think it's worth I'll, it? Call me tomorrow, call me tomorrow, and I'll, 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 I'll talk you through it. All right, Thank Okay. You, um, so Bob Simon says, I, sh I should listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me on NPR. Maybe I should. Saturday mornings at 10 o'clock. It's hilarious. You will okay. laugh for an hour and a half. Give it a okay. try. You know, I, I have crossed that sometimes. Um, so, and I, I did listen to a click and clack. Oh, I don't know, maybe three or four times. One of those two guys had, had a TD, actually. Yes, one has passed away, but you can yes. also still listen to their podcasts on the NPR as well as Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me as a podcast, too. Okay. All right, enjoy. Thank Thanks. you. So Tony DeBella says, um, set valve clearances to factory settings, need to retorque the head in 500 miles anyway, and then you'll reset the valve clearances again. So uh, this probably had to do with my, with my comments about, or he may have been answering the, the chat er, earlier up. Um, but I, I always um, I always run those valve clearances at 30 for the for the first 20, 20 minutes 30 minutes of run in just just so everything can spin. Um, so and Bob Simon uh, is weighed in says love the tape deck looks like a Pioneer receiver. What speakers are you using? I threw away my great my beautiful beautiful great big woofers. And I got, you can see up, up behind me, I got uh, all the little, little, little tiny, little tiny speakers up there. Sounds okay though. And this is a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a Pioneer receiver, still with tubes in it. And it always bugs me. Sometimes I'll, I'll come through in the morning and I'll see it glowing because I forgot to turn it off. And I go, oh my gosh, what am I going to need when I need it? Two cars. 
John, you can sell that tube amp if you want for a mega bucks. Believe me, they're very, very sought after. Just go on uh, uh, Facebook and join a couple of the vintage hi-fi groups and you'll see lots of people out there. I'll put a, I'll take, tape that information on three by five file cards for, for when my kids haul me out of here on a stretcher and they, and they're, it's their, their job to strip the house down. So yeah, I know that that stuff, it's, it's funny. So you can um, also you can buy new tubes today too. If your tubes do go, tubes are available. My best friend from high school is the president of the Washington DC antique radio club. And he said, there's, whatever tubes you want there, everything's out there. So, so, um, Anthony, uh, also says, John, any rebuild, um, um, do, uh, do I have any rebuild sessions scheduled for this winter? No, I mean, we got COVID and when I sold my shop, I lost a lot of the handy stuff that I had, um, the space, the tables, the special tools, and so forth. So I don't know if I'm going to do any gearbox or engine sessions again. I've done some of those remotely, um, but not where I we've got 10 people. The, the biggest gearbox session that we ever had, uh, we had 13, 13 people with gearboxes apart all at the same time. And one guy was totally blind. He had been sight, he'd lost his sight, uh, sort of macular degeneration or something or other. And I, <clears throat> I'm a nice guy most of the time, but if you, if you have ever come to those seminars, um, I'm the gearbox Nazi. I mean, it, you, can't, you can't fool around when you got 12 gearboxes all apart at the same time with a bunch of people who are, who are um, of very different skill sets. So the only guy that really, really followed my rules, like lay everything out in order exactly, the only guy that did that was the blind guy. Um, he had a, he, and he was doing a Healy gearbox. Now, I don't, you know, anyway, um, he had a guy <laughs> with him who could help him out. But that guy was also doing, doing his, his own gearbox. So, yeah, we, I, oh, my gosh, we had hundreds of people that came through and rebuilt their your gearboxes. Those are fun classes. Those are, those, those are great. I, you know, I'm, I miss, I miss all that stuff. So anyway, right. it's gone nine o'clock. I'm, I'm going to push on here. Let me, since it's nine o'clock and we're going to push on, let me um, remind you that there is a PayPal button on my website. And if you go there, um, you can press it and you can, you can um, compensate me for whatever a little bit of knowledge that you've got. You now I ordered a tech book from a guy. My tech, my daughter, adamant that I should get my tech book back in print. I ordered a tech book from an, another guy one time, and it's really thin. It's twenty five bucks years ago. Twenty five bucks is real thin. I was kind of miffed when I opened up the package. Then I started reading through the tech book, and I thought, my gosh, if any one of these hints saves me half a day, oh, it's worth. I mean, come on, it's worth it. So something you've heard here tonight is worth it, something. So go press that PayPal button. Anyway, it's nine o'clock. We're gonna continue on a little bit. Bob Moran, TD brake cylinders have an adjustable ratchet to force contact of the, of the shoe to, to the drum. As a starting position, should they all be set the same to make contact with the drum when turning the wheel? Um, in the starting position, you crank it up until it locks the wheel and back it off one click and then go out and drive it and then adjust them again and then go out and drive it and adjust them again. And you'll have to adjust them a lot um, for the first thousand miles of driving because the radius on the shoes is not the same as the radius on the drums. Once those two arcs become the same, then you hardly ever have to adjust it after that. But in the beginning, um, just crank it up until it locks and then back it off. Now, one problem with, with those early brakes, which are on the bug eye and on the MGAs and on the T-types, not the TC, the TDTF, um, is the mask and adjuster are only of one size. The shoe is only of one size and the drum is of only one size. But now it's 60 or 70 or 80 years later, maybe not 80, 70 years later and 
the shoes aren't quite the same. The drums have been turned eight times. You turn the adjuster and you're almost at full extension of the adjuster before you start to lock up the wheel. So we used to weld a little shim plate on the bottom of the mask. Um, so that's a way, a way to make the mask a little taller and account for all those times that the drum has been turned. That's just an aside. So, okay, here we go. Um, Peter Watt says in, in Peterborough, Ontario, which is just, I don't know if that's in the GTA or just, just outside it, it has high test alcohol-free gasoline for approximately a buck 10 per liter. So you've got to convert all that. First of all, you've got to convert the, the, the liters into gallons, and then you've got to convert the, the uh, Canadian dollar, but it sounds like four, four or five bucks a gallon um, uh, for high test alcohol-free gasoline. But it is out there, and this is available at Costco. Costco, so you can always drive, oh wait, you can't drive to Canada. Um, maybe, maybe next year, huh? So. So Skip Vandermolen has said, do you recommend a higher octane for all MGs? No, no, it's just, it's just a waste of money. Use the lowest octane you can um, that doesn't spark knock uh, or cause the car to diesel. So, you know, with a T-type, a T-type, which came originally came out with what? Eight and a quarter or seven and a quarter compression. I mean, th those things ran on what they called pool. P-O-O-L, pool gasoline, which was 80 octane. Um, so the hot setup, once they came to this country, was to shave the heads and push the, push the compression up. So you get up to 10 to 1, 11 to 1 or something, you got to use some really high octane gasoline. But for almost all other MGs, you can put 89 mid-grade in it. Alcohol gasoline, it runs just fine, just fine. And my own gut is I that you, said you were going to use uh, 90 in your uh, daughter's car. Did I mishear you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yep, absolutely. Yep, 89. Yeah, that, that's, what, it's, that's what's at the pump at Speedway. So, no, I thought you said 97. Oh, no, 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 mm -mm. no. No, that's, that's too high. We're, we're still... And I, I use um, I use the high test um, from Speedway um, in my MGA only because it's got really really high compression. But to use it on an earlier car that that's not high, maybe the MGC needs it, Skip. But um, the 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 T type doesn't need it, and the midget doesn't need it, and A doesn't need it. Um, and I, I'm still convinced that, 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 that the dollars that are involved in that high test gasoline are still um, paying off Hazelwood's beaching of the Exxon Valdez. <laughs> so, you know, that, that was an expensive, that was an expensive, you know, deal. So, anyway. Well, my C runs fine on, uh, you know, 80, 86. So yeah. should I just stick with that? Yeah, just do it. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thank you. Okay, Oak from Mike Grogan in Arizona, Floor Jack. He's got a power built 6040 20, uh, 6042E, 6, 4,000 pound triple lift with locking bar for $110. So it's, oh, maybe he's, he's looking to sell it. I, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's, um, um, you can find Mike Grogan's, uh, his initials, of course, are MG. Um, you, I don't know if he's selling that jack or he's just providing the in information. If he's still on here, you can tell us. But his email address is over in chat, and he is in Arizona, but it's MG at Akeen, A K E E N E dot com. So 110 bucks, that sounds like a, a deal. So. All right, we got a, te a solid technical question here from Steve Cutney. At what temperature do the radiator fans turn on in a 1980 MGB? Is there any relationship between the temperature gauge 
and when the fans go on, and should the fans still be on if the engine is hot and the engine is turned off? So we got a package of a package of questions. Here. I'm gonna, um, unless Steve Cutney's on, but I'm gonna mute everybody because I'm not sure what's. Uh, I'm, I'm on. on. Okay, great. Okay, so um, beginning in '77. Um, I don't know why, but uh, you know that they they put electric fans on. Those things draw more current than anything else in the car except the starter motor. They move a lot of air, and there's no substitute for them. Um, we have twin cooling fans. All the other deliveries, Canada, England, only had one cooling fan. It it only makes sense to put a relay on those on those so that you don't you don't run all that current through that little tiny switch that's inside the radiator i would estimate that those things come on around 200 maybe 205 something like like that it's it's higher than normal on the gauge there in there is an, yet another problem and that is if you buy a gtr 101 temperature sending unit and you put it in your 1977 MGB, it reads wrong. All of them read wrong. They read too hot. Uh, it's very frustrating right now. So the only way to tell really what's going on is to get a um, infrared uh, pyrometer and shoot the shoot the cylinder head and see what's going on. So yeah, I tried that. Okay. Yeah, I, I uh, let me explain a little bit more about this. Yeah. I replaced. I appreciate this appreciate discussion about the uh, clutch and master cylinder because I had problems with that and I replaced it and I go out for a ride and I go down the hill and I notice that the temperature gauge is pegged to the right. So in a panic, I drive home, but nothing happened. But I, you know, I seen it right to the right and, you know, and, and then I turned the car on and I warmed up and the the fans didn't turn on, and I'm wondering what's there was something wrong because I thought they turned on about halfway, but that wasn't the case, you know. And it, it, when you start it up, it pegs off almost to the right, and then uh, so I replaced that temperature gauge. And let me say this: I couldn't find one for a 1980 from any vendor, any place, and I finally got one off eBay from a guy up in Maine, and I was surprised how short they were compared to the other ones. And I was surprised what appears to be so little it's holding them in. And I put some uh, uh, tie downs, you know, those plastic things, yes. electrical <clears throat> things to hold it all in. And I, I, per your video, I have a relay put in. Good, and, good, good. And, and so, you know, I started up and the fans didn't go on. So I thought, gee, there was something else wrong, you know. But then I waited a day and started them up and the fans went on and I happened to have one of those infrared temperature gauges, you know, and I'm going around, it's 185 thermostat, but for some reason on 160, I think things started to happen then because, you know, the temperature went down, you know, at that well, point, I think it started was pumping water, but I mean, I, it may be okay, but I, I went out for a ride and it was kind of pegged to the right, but then after a while it worked its way back to the normal range. And I don't know if my gauge is wrong. I, I ordered a new sensor from Moss. You know, those, are, those are the ones that read high. <clears throat> so, um, so anyway, let's go through some of the things that m might happen. When you put a new thermostat in your car, um, the the old thermostat i mean what, what's it that that big around right yeah. and they used to have a little tickler pin in them they don't anymore so that when you fill up the engine um the air can get out of the thermostat uh, the air can get out of the out of the engine block through through the thermostat it's not there anymore so when you install a new thermostat you've got to drill a little tiny eighth inch hole way off on the edge so air can make its escape when you're filling up the engine. When you're filling up an engine 77 through 80, you fill it through the top on the thermostat housing. You can't fill it through the, through the tank on the side. Um, and even if you fill it up through the thermostat housing, you should um, wait for it to cool down again uh, after you've run it 
and just check it to make sure it's all, all the way full because I, you can get air bubbles trapped in there. If you have air bubbles in the radiator, that, that um, switch, the, ra the fan switch will not operate. It, it, it just, it has to be immersed in water. So we used to have a pumper upper at the shop. We could put it on the, on the um, overflow tank, fill the overflow tank, pump it up and push water into the cooling system, release it, and the bubbles would come out. And you keep doing that until the bu bubbles quit coming out. But for that system to work properly, you cannot have any air in the top of the radiator. And well, I was wondering about that because that seemed to be very hard. Well, and what I did is squeeze the ru rubber uh, radiator hose to tr try to get those air out. And, you know, a little would be coming out all the time. And I think I got it, but I don't know. But and just to go back what you said before, so where do you drill this hole? Right through the thermostat or? Well, off on the edge. I mean, there's a, the, there's a disc. There's a disc and then the valve is in the middle. So okay. out, out on the edge. Uh, uh, way out uh, on the edge, just an eighth inch hole. Okay. So, so, um, so l let me propose that what happened is somehow it didn't get filled with, with water and, or filled with coolant. And so the, the thermostat finally opened and, um, and that allowed some water to get drawn back in uh, oh. le later on or I, in something. So anyway, why does it run? Why does it run when the key is off? It shouldn't. Okay. Switch the wiring. Other, it just runs your, ba your battery down. In 1977, only, in the very beginning of 78, um, they had the ignition and the, and the fans hooked up um, so that uh, they, the, the ignition relay ran them. Uh, they moved the they moved the ignition because the car would continue to run. You take the key out of the out of the tumbler and it just continued to run. Um, and then so they got that sorted out. And they also moved the the operational wire on the the uh, fuse box from the uh, from the fourth position, the fourth fuse, which is always hot, up to the third fuse, which is hot only when the key is on. And then it would only run when the key was on because you you can you can run those fans almost long enough to run the, the run the battery flat. Um, it, they take a lot of energy. People, you know, you go into work and somebody come in and say, "Hey, dude, your car's still running." And you go, "What?" You go out and the fans are still running, but that's only seventy seven and yours, Steve, because that's the way somebody wired it up. So get that that power lead to the fans moved someplace of course it, the third fuse is the is the, the well deal. you know i asked that question it doesn't seem like it's doing it now but i thought it did it in the past and one of my friends who may have a 77 i'll have to ask him again because i forget what year he has he said it went on so i i just wasn't sure about that sure. that's all sure okay thank you so, very much if you get some more questions, you know, call, call me and, and we, we can we can go go over that. So sure. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now Crystal's weighed in from Texas here. After pulling the rear axle and rear springs, I noticed the mounting bracket for the forward portion of the rear spring uh, has one bolt hole that is slightly elongated, not supposed to be. It's approximately a quarter inch elongated only on one side of the bracket. Do I have to cut it out and replace the bracket? No. What you would do, let's see, which, which way, it, it, the reason it's elongated is because the bolt was loose and as the spring, as, as the spring was, was coming up, it was pushing the, the spring, uh, pushing it forward. So it's probably elongated forward. It's probably not elongated backwards. This is my guess. You can I usually can't tell which way. Yeah, you can usually tell by taking a look at it. So what you would do, you wouldn't cut the bracket out. You would you would take a, a thick washer with a seven sixteenths hole in it, not three eighths. That bolts seven sixteenths, seven sixteenths thick washer, um, and um, you you'd put it on there put a bolt in there so that it was positioned and then weld that new washer 
onto the ear that's there. I wouldn't cut the ear that's there off. That would be that because getting the new ear replacement ear on and it would be impossible to get it exactly correct. But that would be the way to, to do it and, and just weld weld something with that same kind of thickness that the ear has right now onto there. So okay so the washer would go on the outside of the bracket and then I MIG weld the washer to the outside of the bracket after I align the holes. Correct. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Okay. And James has weighed in about Brad Penn oil. And it's available from Summit Racing. So Rich Winslow from California. Is AMS oil worth the cost in the MGB? I personally, I don't think so. Um, that's a personal opinion because um, you got to change the oil every season anyway. The oil gets dirty. I mean, maybe it's worth it in an engine that doesn't get dirty and doesn't drip oil and stuff. But I, I never thought that the, that it was worth. I, I know they make a lot of claims about stuff, um, but I don't think it's it's worth that. You still on there, Rich? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hey. Good to see you again, John. I haven't seen you in a long time. Thanks for those magazines. Um, no, I I. Uh, I Ems, Ems, is that still selling for about eight bucks a quart? Yeah, it, I think so. Yeah, it's, I, it's pretty expensive. I've always been a little suspicious of their demonstration thing anyway. Oh, it's starting the, the lawnmower up and pouring uh, pouring concrete on it and it still runs without oil or something. Yeah, um, it, it all has to do with it with the zinc in it. Um, if, if it's got 1200 parts per million of ZDDP, then, then it's okay to use, but if it doesn't, I, I wouldn't use it. And it probably doesn't have that in it. I mean, probably not. And the VR1 is, is, the, same, is the same price. So. Thank you. Okie doke. And my next question up is from Daniel, and do you recommend VR1 for a TR6 also? Yes, absolutely, yes. And for a T-type and for a midget, yes, 2050, VR1. So um, Doug Miller's weighed in and said, Brad, can't, Brad Penn Oil can be purchased online. That's how he gets it. And uh, Peter Koreski says Amazon has all types of break-in oil at a good price. I just looked. So Schroeder has weighed in here and said, my TD has always displayed what I thought was low oil pressure, 20 pounds. Yeah, that's really low, really low. A very mature mechanic asked how my copper hose ran uh, from the oil pump. Did it run up to the head and then to the dash? And I said, yes. He said, there's a reducer in the head and 20 pounds is probably good. Uh, if the copper line dr ran directly to the gauge, it would probably read 40 pounds or more. Yes, Schroeder, that is exactly correct. Um, the first T-types that came out in the first year or two, uh, they took the, they read the oil pressure off the head. There's a huge pressure loss there. So, um, and there's too much oil that gets up to the valves on a T-type anyway. So, um, there are two things to do on your car. Um, one is to move the oil pressure line down to the bottom fitting to get a more accurate reading of what your oil pressure truly is and it should 40 is low way too low it should be up around 60 to 70 pounds um, so you can move it down there unfortunately that involves moving the, in, the little brass intermediate piece that goes between the flexible line that goes from the firewall down to the engine and and, um, and then the capillary line that goes from that intermediate brass piece up to the back of the gauge. You have to move that intermediate piece, uh, which is no big deal, only that you can't get your arms around and so you have to have somebody else hold the inside of the nut and it might be affixed to the same bolt that holds the coil, I can't remember. Um, anyway, it's always a good idea to move the oil pressure line to the bottom fitting. You just switch the top and bottom fittings 
and uh, in, in your audit, and then you get an accurate oil pressure reading, but you're still getting some pressure loss there. So what we always did was to take the top banjo bolt, tap it, quarter 28, get a Holly carburetor jet that you can buy from Napa with about a 55, 50, 55 thousandths hole in it. I haven't got the part number in front of me, I can't remember. And that's got a quarter inch th thread and screw that into the end of that, that bolt and then screw the bolt back into the engine. And now the oil going up into the valve train has been severely reduced and you get less smoking, um, less leaking, and the oil pressure is still adequate up there. It still drips down the pushrod tubes and oils the cam, which it's supposed to do. And your oil pressure on your oil pressure gauge will read even more accurately, but it really should be up around 60, 70 pounds. So, uh, I've got some background here. I'm gonna mute everybody. And I've got everybody muted because something was going on. So, okay, from Graham Janaway, Edelbrock, 1070 SAE 30, high performance synthetic break-in engine oil. So Edelbrock makes a, a 30 weight, high performance, whatever that is, synthetic break-in engine oil. So there's, there's a lot of that stuff out there. there. There really is. Okay, from Bill Baumer, here's a, here's a, tech, a, a mechanical question. Is there an easy way to remove the head the headrest on a 74 MGB. I want to install the seat belt supports that fit on the headrest posts. Um, go back, watch a Jackie Chan movie or something, something with, with some kung fu because that's the attitude that you need here. A BGT. You can't stand up in a BGT. There's not an easy way to do this. <laughs> On a roadster, you stand inside the car with one foot sort of on the on the on the hump, the the drive drive shaft hump, and the other one um, on the on the door jam, and you grab you grab the um, the headrest and you push it down, and then you go yeah and pull it up, and then it doesn't work. It's because you didn't say yeah and you didn't have enough attitude. When you push it back down, you do it again, it comes out. But on a, on a GT, you might have to take the seat out. I do remember that I have a um, YouTube video about putting the seats back in. Taking the seats out, that's easy. That's just four bolts. But when you go to put it back in, there's two tracks, two wood strips, four bolts, and four spacers. And it, it can... It, it can drive you a little crazy trying to get those seats back in, but I don't know how to do it in the car. You, you really need, you really need to, to pull with all your strength on a, on a motion, on a fluid motion up to get those things off. So, sorry, no easy way here. So it's coming down to, uh, I've still got, still got some questions here, but here's a basic driving question from, uh, from Dale. On my MGB slowing down from stop, I usually downshift and only use the brakes sparingly until the end. Is this better than using the brakes and causing more brake wear, or does it do more harm to the clutch? The, cl the clutch, you should, never, you should never slip the clutch, um, but the more times you use the clutch, the shorter the clutch life is going to be. I never shift into first uh, on, onto a B, obviously not on a, uh, you can't shift into a first with a non-synchro, um, but I, I never shift it into first. So I usually, I probably knock it into neutral at, uh, when I'm still in third, I don't even know, maybe knock it into neutral, come from third to, to neutral and then brake to a stop. You can change brake pads and brake shoes so easily compared to changing a clutch. So, I'm not sure if I changed it changed down in, in the in the second or not. I just don't know. Um, 
can't tell you, but but I can tell you that ch changing brake pads and brake shoes is a whole lot easier than than changing the the clutch. So Steve Olson um, says he bought his brake adjuster tool in Victoria British, and that wrench has two size ends and works fine. Is that a square or is that a ratchet on there, Steve? You still on? I don't see. <laughs> No, nope. I got Eric. Eric, you you got a. It's uh, like listening to the chipmunks. Um, Eric, I I I I have to mute you because it sounds like the chipmunks. I don't know some kind of feedback or or something or other. So, uh, yeah, it's a square wrench, John. Okay, so you have to use it over and over and over. It's sure. Not ratcheting. No, it's not. It's cheap, yeah. but it works. Yeah. Okay. All right. So like Fred Fred Levy's, too, it might have. It might have more mechanical advantage than Fred's, where you got to use your your uh, your wrist. So um, um, okay. So don't knock my water faucet. <laughs> <laughs> so the water faucet. Then you got to put a pair of ice grips on it. You know. So yeah. Uh, um, so uh, Harry's iPhone says. My 73 MGB gas gauge has never worked since I got it four years ago. I went to an MG fix it session last Saturday. They tested my gauge and it tested out as working. The gas tank and sender were new three years ago. The gauge did not work after the new gas tank and sender. So now we're back to crystal. And that is that the new, some of the new parts that we get are made in our favorite Asian country and they don't work. Or they don't work for long. So um, you just need another sending unit. That's what it is, I'm sure. And a new, a new ARA 1501 and ARA 15102 um, uh, seal and gasket. So you run the gas tank down to as far, as low as you possibly dare. You don't want to run out of gas. We're too old to run out of gas. Jack the car up on the right hand side, put the jack underneath where the, where the uh, factory jack would go. I usually use a two by four in there so it doesn't crush the metal. And um, put jack stands on it so the car's up, 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 you can't turn the car over. There's no, no, no matter how high you get the car, you can't turn it over. I've never turned one over, I should say. And um, can't. And uh, put jack stands underneath. And now all the gasoline that was in there is moved over to the passenger side, to the driver's side, to the left-hand side, and you can take the, the seal out and change the sending unit. That's it. It has to be grounded, but it's almost impossible not to ground a tank. I mean, a tank's got, how many bolts hold the tank in? Eight, 10? I mean, it's awfully difficult to put a tank in and have it so coated that you never got a ground. It's probably not the problem. It's probably the sending unit is faulty. So it's 932 and I've, I've got I've, I've to cut loose here. So um, our, next, our next session is going to be um, not next Tuesday because that's the election. So I'll be up all night, I'm sure. Um, um, it'll be the week after that. And it'll, so that's the second week of November. So I'll send a, a note out. If you're not on my email distribution list, go to my website and punch the on the top on the top ribbon. It says join join our newsletter, and you can put your name in there, and it automatically adds you to constant contact. And then you get your information through there. Thank goodness we weren't Zoom bombed tonight. Thank you to whatever MG gods there there are. We I I worked heavily at this to. Um, so that you'd have to put a um, password in. And I wanted to define the password in a way that the Russians wouldn't know how to, that's where my daughter says that uh, all this stuff comes from. Um, the Zoom bombing, the good stuff, like what we had a couple of weeks ago, um, comes out of robots out of, out of Russia. So anyway, they wouldn't know what year the MG plant closed. So, um, or they wouldn't take the time to look it up. So anyway, while you're on my website, if you'd be so kind and touch the PayPal button, that would be very nice. My daughter is um, 
moving to Los Angeles. She's going tomorrow. I'm going to go out just before Christmas and, and uh, bring out her MGB GT. I'll put some pictures of that up, up on my Facebook. I do a lot of stuff on Facebook. She's been here six months during COVID. She quit New York City and moved here during the COVID. And then, and then while she was here, decided, because she's in the movie biz, that, she, that Hollywood, Hollywood's magnet was stronger than New York. So she's moving out there. She's been here six months and two days ago, I complained and said that, that my website wasn't good and that the link from my website to, to cons and contact wasn't working as it turns out it was. But uh, she said, I can fix that. And I said, well, what do you know about websites? And she goes, I, I, everything. <laughs> I said, really, been here six months? And all, that, all those six months, we haven't touched my website. So I hope that it's coming soon. I'm going to have some improvements in my website and it won't be as static as it has been for the past year. Anyway, thank you everybody for being here and um, I appreciate, appreciate your support. I love doing this. You can tell I love doing this. If I could do text seminars, I would do that. I'm, uh, if you belong to the Southern New Jersey MG Car Club, um, to be, uh, we're doing a private session on uh, November 5th. Um, couple days after the election. And um, um, if your club, if your club wants to do a, a private session, hey, I'm, 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 I'm game. Uh, just contact me, call me something or other. And, and uh, we can set something up. Ha happy to do it. So at this, I'm going to say um, safety fast to everybody and, and wish everybody a, 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 a good night. And um, um, you can un unmute. Yeah, I used to be able to unmute everybody, but now I can't. So I, I would unmute everybody. But if you un want to unmute yourself, you can. Thank you, John. See you later. John. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, John. Thanks, John. Thank you. John. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank your wife or your sister. Thank you, John. Help me out. So Phil Ryan, nice to see you on on tonight. So I, I missed the I missed the uh, um, local uh, drive. Couple of weeks ago, I understand. Well, we had a great time. Yeah, I, I understand you, you. You were there, so that that's great. And it was fun. Thanks, John. It's a real have a good day, John. See you again. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, John. Everybody See you on the, vote. See Thanks, you on the John. Time with the uh, South Jersey tonight. We're looking forward to the to the uh, barriers coming down and being able to get up into Canada. I, I miss. I miss those guys, Sean. You know, I'm supposed to be down there in January. You know, your your uh, your main man there made me promise I'd come in. in uh, <laughs> he 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 twisted the screw. So I'm I'm supposed to be down for for. You can un unmute yourself if you want. Um, I'm supposed to be down in in January to work on his Triumph. What's it, a Renown? Is that what he bought? I, I you're you're muted. I so I I can't hear you. I don't know how to un unmute you, but if you go down to the, um, there we go. Yeah. There we go. A Triumph um, Renown, a 1949 Triumph Renown. Triumph Renown. He's been looking at this thing for several years. Hey. And uh, you know, it's a car disease. I don't know. Yeah. Triumph okay. M2. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, I'm I'm looking forward to see seeing you you guys in uh, January. Okay. Look forward to it too. As long as, John, riots, as long as the riots still aren't going. So. Yeah. Yeah. John, are you aware of uh, 40 years ago this month? Well, well, last week, 40 years ago, was when the MG factory closed, well, I believe. I'm, I am I'm more than aware of it because my son, uh, my, my number four kid, um, put a gun to his head last October 22nd. And even though that's when I consider he died, because that's when he died. They have a protocol at the hospital and they called his death and his death certificate is, is written up as October 23rd. And that's the same day that the last MGs rolled off the line at Abingdon. So yes, I, had, I, I was aware of that, but I wasn't aware of it until somebody called it to my attention. So just last week, maybe it was you. So anyway. Uh, an odd year, tough year. So, tough year. Uh, tough year, John. Hey, Sean, we'll see you later. I'll see you later. Good night.
Okay. Yeah, and thanks a lot for everything, huh? Really hey. appreciate it. Oh, hey, very, very nice. Doug and I were at the same uh, Beatles concert in uh, <laughs> Chicago. Well, not exactly the same one, but almost yeah. at White Sox Park in, in yeah. the summer of 1965. Yeah. John, you, you got there first. You got there hey. five yeah. hours before I did. I went to the 8 o'clock concert. You went to the 3 o'clock concert. Yeah, well, I, 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 we paid uh, $3.50 for the seats. No, excuse me. We paid 5 bucks for the seats. We got the expensive seats. And, and we missed the action because the action was in the cheap seats. All, always is a takeaway, you know. So, Tom Snook, it's a pleasure. What do you got? You got something there you're trying to show me. Yes, yeah, I'm trying to show you, John. It's the cover from the course that I took from you either on February 9th or the week of February 9th or the week of February 16th, 1990 on rebuilding SU carburetors. Hey, okay. All right. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for being there. You're welcome. And uh, Barney Gaylord, I, he's on. He's on. I don't see his picture, but Barney's on. Uh, if you've got an MGA, you go to to MGA Guru. That's Barney's site. There's, I don't know, six thousand pages of of just all kinds of all kinds of stuff, and a lot of it applies to uh, to, to the MGBs, uh, just because it, you know there's the evolution of systems or T types. So yeah, this is Barney. I'm here. Can you hear me? Barney, yeah, yeah. Oh cool. I don't know why my picture doesn't work. It craps out once in a while. Yeah. Where where <laughs> are you tonight, Barney? You're always on the road. Uh Columbia, South Carolina. Okay. <laughs> okay. We but we're still moving around, but I think we're camped out here for a couple of months now. Okay. All right. So yeah, Barney Barney travels with his son. And uh, he lives lives in his lives not in his MGA but almost. So yeah. Barney Barney has a little trailer and uh, that he hauls with him. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and, uh, yep. So Barney's answering tech questions and Elliot's chasing uh, chasing something on on his computer screen. So yep. Yep. So anyway, support Barney. How, however, Barney gets supported too. So. And if you don't have a PayPal button on your site, Barney, get one. It works. So, so anyway, well, anyway, it's uh, 941. So anyway, gentlemen, ladies, thank you very kindly. And we'll look forward to seeing everybody soon. Fred, see ya. Bye-bye. Bye, John. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, John. Later, man. Pleasure.